Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, buenos dias y bienvenido a todos. I invite you all to be seated. You're all seated already so we can get the proceedings underway. Um, my name is Professor Rick Valenta. I'm the director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at the University of Queensland and I'm going to be your MC for today's colloquium. At the SMI, so much of our work is focused on understanding and optimizing the role of resources in future global sustainability. And we're truly in a time where achieving net zero and responsibly sourcing the resources we're going to need for net zero um, is more important than it ever has been. So I'm really excited by the topics of today's program. Given the people in this room, I'm sure we're, we're going to have a lot to discuss. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands uh, on which we meet today. On behalf of the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. And I'd like to also quickly go over some housekeeping. In case of an emergency, please evacuate by the exits and follow directions from the staff. For bathrooms, please go back into the foyer and follow the signage down the stairs. Um, I'd also like to make some acknowledgements. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our guests, ambassadors, chargé d'affaires, and other members of the diplomatic corps representing Chile, Cuba, Ecuador, Guatemala, Peru, Uruguay, and Bolivia. So very welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Our keynote speaker, Ms. Namali Makai, um, and panelists, all of the panelists who've agreed to participate today, our representatives from government and industry, our UQ colleagues, our distinguished guests, and of course, our online viewers, welcome. Many of you are familiar faces, um, having participated in this forum for a while, um, and some I think are new as well. So welcome to all of you. We're thrilled that you're able to uh, join us for this colloquium. We really want to make this event as interactive as possible. Earlier today, hopefully, um, you would have received an email reminder with a digital copy of the program. Um, you can also access this program via the QR code on your lanyards. And for our online viewers, please use the Q&A function for any questions. And for the in-person audience, we have two roving microphones for the Q&A sessions. And you'll see in the program that we're using Padlet. This is a real-time collaborative web platform where you can share comments, notes, and content. And I encourage you all to connect, share your thoughts, and to use this to network through the colloquium, regardless of where you are, in person or online. We'll keep the Padlet online for a few weeks uh, post-event for any further comments or thoughts to keep the discussions and networking going. This event's also being recorded, and we'll share the link with you as soon as possible. Today we're celebrating the 16th UQ Latin American Colloquium, a wonderful occasion to bring together UQ and our Latin American colleagues to share insights and experiences to discuss matters of global importance. I have no doubt that today's theme will spark lots of discussion and help pave a way forward for our two regions as we work towards a clean and more sustainable energy future. So we have a full schedule today, and I'll now hand over to the University of Queensland's Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Partnerships, Mr. Brett Lovegrove, to say a few words. Welcome, Brett. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 16th UQ Latin American Colloquium. In commencing today's event, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional ownership, uh, the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the University of Queensland, I pay respects to their ancestors and their descendants. I'd also like to acknowledge and offer warm welcome to our special guests today, including our ambassadors and heads of mission. We have His Excellency, Mr. Jaime Chomali, uh, the Ambassador of Chile. We have His Excellency, Mr. Arturo Carabe, Ambassador of Ecuador. We have His, His Excellency, Mr. Ronald Resinos, Ambassador of Guatemala. We have His Excellency, Mr. Vitialano Gaspar Galado Valencia, Ambassador of Peru. Uh, we have Her Excellency, Mrs. Daniela Pai, Ambassador of Uruguay. And we have, to have Dr. Daniel Gaspari, Charged the affairs of Venezuela. Thank you very much. 
We also have the State Member for Greenslopes, the Honourable Joe Kelly, MP. Thank you, Joe. We have Mr Alejandro Palmer, Trade and Investment Commissioner for Latin America. Can I see? Welcome, Alejandro, and congratulations on your appointment, your first few weeks in the job, and thanks for joining us straight away uh, uh, here in Brisbane. Uh, we have guests from industry, our partner universities and research institutes, including Mrs. Ms. Namiela Mackay, Managing Director, Critical Minerals Association of Australia, our keynote speaker for today. We have UQ colleagues, one and all. Thank you very much for coming. This is the 16th iteration, as I mentioned, of this event, which is something UQ is very proud of. It's one of the rare opportunities to host so many leaders from foreign embassies, from industries, from the higher education sector, together in one room. And for that, we are hugely appreciative of your ongoing commitment and support. Since 2007, we've welcomed leaders from Latin American governments, from industry and the higher education sector together to connect with our researchers and our university staff. Together, we have discussed emerging opportunities and explored ways to address grand challenges of interest to both regions. The Latin American Colloquium, and we're going to call it LAC for short uh, from now on, if that's okay, is just one aspect of our strong and long-standing partnership with you, between UQ and Latin America date, dating back 40 years. The university's people-to-people -people links with Latin American universities, with government agencies, with corporate networks and non-government organisations have led to hundreds of research publications and projects and impactful new ways of working. They have also encouraged thousands of international students to join our Brisbane campuses. In the past five years alone, and considering in those five years we've had the pandemic, around 1,000 Latin American students have enrolled in programs at UQ. Those students have joined us from Chile, from Ecuador, from Colombia, Brazil and Peru, and many more. Almost half of those students have enrolled in postgraduate coursework programs and will take home with them connections and cross-cultural skills that will make the future better and brighter for the next generations. In many ways, those students will be responsible for delivering on all of the ideas and the, the promises that we make today. In addition, our Spanish language courses are also significant, not only for UQ students, but for the broader community. In the past five years, around 4,000 students have enrolled in Spanish language courses throughout the, through the School of Languages and Cultures. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and more than 800 Latin American students have enrolled through courses through UQ College. Supporting joint research, student and researcher mobility, co-publications and teaching innovation. UQ also has more than 40 agreements with Latin American institutions. These links are strengthened by almost 100 staff who were born in Latin America, as well as several staff with qualifications from the region. In August, I had the privilege of joining our, a senior executive mission led by our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry Ao, to Chile and Brazil to meet with our university partners, government, industry and alumni. It was our first visit to Latin America since the start of the global pandemic and we were hugely encouraged by the outcomes from our discussions. There are so many exciting opportunities in the Latin American region stemming from the excellent work of UQ's Sustainable Minerals Institute, International Centre of Excellence in Chile, under, this, under the Sustainable Minerals Institute led by Professor Rick Valenta. The centre, led by Dr Douglas Aiken, who many of you will know has joined us online this evening, I think, or last night uh, in Chile, uh, has built an impressive reputation for improving the social impact of mining in the region. The centre will continue to be a platform for UQ's faculties, schools and institutes to engage with a diverse set of Latin American partners and have a pro positive impact across the broader region. It was fantastic on that visit to meet with new and emerging collaborators, to deepen our engagement with long-standing partners and to sign agreements, which all cemented our commitment to collaboration across the region. And with our colleagues at Austrade and TIQ, as well as Australian embassies in Chile and Brazil, we hosted fantastic events to engage with our local UQ alumni. Again, these connections would not be possible without the people in this room. 
It is because of our shared vision and goals that we can connect and have such a meaningful impact across diverse areas. But on to today. For the 16th iteration of LAC, we turn our focus to powering Australia and Latin America towards a clean energy future. We will explore the complexities of this global issue and work together for a cleaner, reliable and more affordable energy system. Our respective governments are united in their commitment to meeting net zero agendas and to, put, to establish sustainable energy policies for the long-term benefit of countries worldwide. It is our hope that today's colloquium will enable us to unpack and explore some of the challenges that stand in our way so we can conti continue to collaborate for change. So thank you again for taking part in the 16th UQ Latin American Colloquium. And thank you to my colleague, Professor Rick Valenta, Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute for chair chairing today's session. To commence proceedings, I would now like to introduce His Excellency, Ronald Resinos, Ambassador of Guatemala, to speak with you this morning. Have a wonderful day and thank you. Good evening, everyone. Special thanks to University of Queensland for the organization of this uh, colloquium, or LAC, like Brett called it today. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having us and for welcoming us here in the, in the university. A special acknowledgment to uh, our friend Joe Kelly, member of the Friends of Latin America group in the uh, Parliament of, of Queensland. It's always a pleasure to be here in the University of Queensland, a university that has always shown appreciation towards Latin America and with which all of the embassies hold very strong ties through internship programs where we have students come into our embassies every year and especially through this colloquium. This is the third Latin American colloquium in which I have the honor of participating. I am sure just like the previous one, previous ones, we will be able to explore different ways in which Australia and Latin America can and should work together in the accomplishment of our common goals, but most importantly, in the solution of our common challenges. Government and politics alone cannot provide solutions we all hope for, because governments need the input from key players in order to be able to make informed decisions that are based on accurate data and the reality that many times cannot be seen from offices in government buildings. Two of the most important key players in the decision-making process are, one, universities. Universities should supply researchers that can provide the data and analysis needed to create informed decisions. And second, businesses and entrepreneurs who day-to-day -day see the reality, live the reality, and suffer with the reality, but they, but they don't do it from an office in government. In government. They do it sweating it out and risking their own money. This is why events like this are so important, because it is necessary not only to hear from the universities, researchers, and businesses, but also to support them and incentivize them. We live in a globalized world, but that also means that we live in a world in which our problems are common and affect us all. For example, climate change. Climate change is not an issue that is going to affect only certain nations. It's not an issue that is going to affect only rich nations or poor nations. It's not an issue that is going to affect only big nations or only small nations. It's an issue that is going to affect us all drastically. And the only way to fight it is if we all do it together. This year, Colloquium focuses on powering Australia and Latin America towards a clean energy future. And in that regard, there are so many partnering opportunities between Australia and Latin America. Partnerships between universities are essential, and the promotion of researchers on both sides of the hemisphere is a necessity because this will provide pathways so that businesses can follow later. Latin America has, been, has many mining resources that have always been attractive to many first world nations and others. And investing into finding ways to use those resources while minimizing the harm to the environment is a good idea and a good investment. But looking at Latin America as much more than just a mine would be even better because we do have much more to offer. Prioritizing investment in research, 
science and businesses in areas such as green hydrogen. It's only an example of something that would be beneficial for both of us and for the whole world. I hope this colloquium can serve as an eye-opener for all the opportunities that lie in front of us and all the possible partnerships that can come from these opportunities. Welcome to the Latin American Colloquium. Thank you. Thanks very much, Your Excellency. I would now like to introduce our moderator for the first panel discussion, uh, Professor Claire Cote, who's the director for the Center, of Water, uh, Center for Water and the Minerals Industry at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Please come to the stage, Claire. Um, to, and Claire will be mod moderating our first panel, which is supporting the reliable supply of critical minerals in Australia and Latin America and introducing our, our panelists. So over to you, Claire. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rick. Um, this is working? Okay, great, thank you. Well, we are delighted to be um, having this conversation with you today on the topic of um, supporting the reliable supply of critical minerals in Australia and Latin America. I am absolutely delighted to have three women joining me today for the discussion, so I will introduce them. Uh, first, Helen de Jelling. Please join me. So Helen is Project Acquisition Manager for Cobalt Blue Holdings. Welcome, Helen. Thank you very much. Uh, please, there's a chair and a handheld microphone for you to be able to share um, your views. Our second um, panelist is Liliana Paliero from the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Welcome, Liliana. <laughs> and finally, our third panelist is uh, Dr. Janelle Simpson from uh, Minerals Geoscience at the Geological Survey of Queensland. Welcome, Janelle. And I hope for, for the ones in the room, and sorry people online if you can't see it, but Janelle and Helen, congratulations on your outfit and matching the UQ brand on your purple. So uh, thank you very much for, and Liliana's pretty good effort as well. Well done. I didn't do terribly well. I'm sorry, I apologize. So, um, so that we can, uh, um, the aim of this panel is to, to share our perspectives on the topic. And um, we have people here with a wide range of skills and different types of experience and perspective. So what I will do first, I will ask you to introduce yourself briefly and give, give us your perspective on the topic in two or three minutes. Helen. Is this one on? Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, my name is Helen Deschling. I'm a geologist, an exploration geologist by background. I don't do a lot of geology anymore, though. I've worked, had a bit of time in government um, working with Janelle, and now I'm back in industry working with a small company called Cobalt Blue. And as the name suggests, there's a bit of feedback. As the name suggests, we're focused on, on critical minerals and my job is particularly to find those opportunities in mine waste, such as tailings. So in terms of a, of a clean energy future and how we source metals, my perspective is we've got to do it better and, and more efficiently and, and there's a lot of people in this room and, and up here on the stage who have a lot of experience in thinking up ways to do that. So look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Helen. Liliana. Please introduce yourself and, and give us your perspective. Thank you, Claire. Well, I am Liliana Bagliero. I am originally from Chile. I'm a hydrologist and I work here at the Center for Water in the Mineral Industry at SMI in, at UQ. Um, in the past, well, since working at SMI, I've been working a lot with uh, in our office in Chile. So I've been in contact with the problematic uh, of uh, the mining industry in Latin America. Uh, my view is on the um, on the topic today is that um, where we are all uh, in a race for decarbonisation and we are for for that we are transitioning um, to a renewable energy, uh, but we need uh, critical minerals for it. Um, critical minerals like uh, cobalt, copper, nick, uh, lithium, for example. And in that perspective, Australia and Latin America are very well positioned to supply the world with these uh, critical minerals. But in this race, we cannot, um, we have to do it right. We cannot neglect the environment and the social in impacts that mining has. So um, 
we, I was recently at a conference where we were discussing this very topic, and someone says, the environment is getting in the way of the environment. Uh, my view on this is that to allow a sustainable transition, we need not only work towards um, meeting the increasing demands of critical minerals in a responsible manner, but as we as society, we also need to be responsible in how we live our lives and make real changes, reducing drastically our resources and energy consumption and demands. This way will be the only way that would allow us to transition in a less frantic and more sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. And Janelle, please uh, introduce yourself and, and give us your perspective. Uh, so I'm Janelle Simpson. I work for the Geological Survey of Queensland, which is part of the Queensland Department of Resources. So my group is primarily focused on how do we support exploration in Queensland to find the critical minerals that we're really all seeking for net zero. Um, there's a variety of ways that we do this and historically it's really focused on understanding the geology, understanding the geophysics and providing that data out to industry. But I think because of the scale of the critical minerals challenge, I think we're starting to think differently about how we support the industry. We're expanding the focus of our projects so we're not just doing grassroots geoscience research, we're broadening our focus into things like understanding secondary prospectivity of mine waste, how do we understand how some concepts like the circular economy can support a change in the way our mining companies think about resources, and how do we make sure that our data is available not just to geoscientists but to all of our community members, all of the other disciplines, and make sure that everyone can get the best advantage out of this data that we gather. So really, I think as we move forward trying to supply all the critical minerals and support the industry in finding them, we're finding that the best way to do that is to broaden our focus, to broaden our understanding and our collaborations across a range of sectors. So that's that's what I get up to and what we're thinking about going into the future. Great. Thank you. Very exciting, Janelle. So to support this panel discussion, we've prepared a few questions. I'll try and, and, and check the time, but I really want this to be an engaging and possibly a thought-provoking discussion. So, Janelle, I will start with you. Um, throughout your career, you've been a passionate contributor to uh, the identification and understanding of mineral resources, but you've been promoting, and you've just mentioned that this stronger integration of geophysics, geology, of multiple disciplines working together and trying to foster cooperation between all these various disciplines. So, in terms of delivering a reliable supply of critical minerals, how do you envisage that the technical specialists, the researchers, the government departments, the industry representatives, how should they work together to create conditions that will be conducive to this diversified investment that we need? Um, so obviously I'm very biased and I'd love to see our geological, geological surveys get as much funding as possible to do the great work that they do. But I wanna focus on really three points um, to answer this question. I think it really comes down to improved coordination between all of our stakeholder groups, um, targeted support from government to industry, so thinking about how we can best use those resources, and ensuring that we've actually got a talent supply chain coming into our sector. So I think this one's a bit of a hidden problem at the moment. It won't be in 10 to 20 years when we don't have any technical people to support um, our critical minerals exploration industry. So if I dig down a little bit more on each of those topics, uh, I think there's a lack of genuine coordination across disciplines. And in pondering why that might be, I've kind of landed on the idea that it's really a lack of a shared language, a shared understanding of what we're trying to do. And if we can't communicate properly to people in other disciplines and get them on board with what we're trying to do and understand their challenges and try and see how we can work together to solve um, the critical minerals challenge, we're never going to get anywhere quickly because only together can we get somewhere more quickly than alone. Um, so I think really what's lacking is a common language, a common language to try and understand what uh, we're trying to achieve in the critical mineral space so that communities can understand what we're doing, so that First Nations people can understand what we're doing, and so that um, our stake, like our technical people, can communicate properly with those various groups. So 
The thought that I've had recently is that maybe this challenge, this path to net zero, this enormous task that sits in front of us, is an opportunity to try and align um, our coordination and our communication efforts towards a, a common goal because it matters to everyone, right? Not everyone cares about, you know, Rio Tinto making a profit on the site. That's Rio Tinto's problem. Everyone cares about making sure we've got a, a world to live in in 50 years' time that's hospitable to us. And so what we need to do is think about more broadly what the resources sector has to contribute in that. And I think the emerging um, circular economy um, I don't think it's a trend, but the concept of how the circular economy um, of not just recycling, but making sure that the resources we use are used to their best advantage and then our waste is managed in a way that it doesn't harm the environment and we reuse waste that comes from other sections of the community so that we overall minimise the amount of extractive resources that we need. If we can think about how resources sits in that framework, I think we've got a better um, chance of communicating to the community more broadly and coordinating our efforts towards finding these critical minerals. How am I going on time? Oh, you're good. Okay. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I, so that's the communication problem and, and the sorts of opportunities that sit for us there in terms of better coordination. If I think about the role of government in that, because obviously I work for government, um, I wanted to call out three different um, initiatives that we've got that are thinking differently about how we fund um, innovation in this sector. So we've had a long running uh, project with SMI on tailings prospectivity, secondary prospectivity of tailings material at either operating mines or abandoned mine sites. How do we make the best use of that, minimise the waste that's on these sites and um, support what is really cutting edge research being done by UQ and SMI? So I think that's a great example of funding innovation in a way that, you know, pushes the envelope. Um, we've We've started conversations with UQ about um, a research alliance, so trying to put in place a coordinated body that is going to be um, really doing research on all aspects of ESG. So how do we behave more uh, in a better way environmentally for the society and in a governance fashion so that our companies um, and our industry can really take that knowledge generated through primary research into ESG from the university and apply it to their practices. Um, and another slightly out of the box thing that we're doing is, um, and this is not my group specifically, but it's the broader department that I work for. We're generating a common user facility up in Townsville. So this is a shared bit of infrastructure to try and help people um, do research into how to extract some of these more unusual metals out of their ores. So how do we process um, cobalt out of copper? Or how do we process uh, germanium out of tin? How do we Traditionally, we haven't bothered and it just goes into the waste pile and it's not utilised properly. So by putting in some common facilities that people can use, maybe we can generate some innovation in the processing side of things. So those are just some examples of the sorts of projects that we're trying to do a bit differently um, yeah. to what we've done historically. Um, and then I think the one that does enough attention is the lack of people coming into the geoscience discipline. So this is not just a problem in Australia, it's a global problem and we're really seeing a decline in the number of students coming out of geoscience, decline in the number of courses that are available to them and it's something that's going to become a larger and larger problem um, as we go for forward because our demand for these skills is actually increasing. So I think I think there's a couple of things here, but it all comes down to a cultural shift in the industry. I think most people are aware that as we go through a career in geoscience, we do lose um, a disproportionate amount of women in this industry, and that's a cultural problem. That's the challenges that women face in this industry. It makes us less appealing as a job prospect. 
and it stops students either at school or university really wanting to come. So, um, Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're we're really losing the opportunity to get the best and brightest minds into our discipline because we've got a cultural problem um, that sits in the core of the profession that can be addressed, and we need strong leaders to address it. But it um, it really stops us getting all the talent we really need. Thank you, Janelle. You've raised three very important points here. Um, in terms of this ongoing skill support, um, there are a lot of conversations happening within um, universities and the broader research um, framework and how we support that and just exploring different ways of teaching people the skills they need. So a lot more focus on short courses, micro-credentials, online courses to try and attract more people uh, into the industry, so geoscience, but the broader skill set that the industry needs. I just want to make a quick comment about your common language. You know, you were saying, how do we find ways for people to work together more effectively? So this is something that is being explored by researchers as well. We're bringing different skills skill set from the whole of, of um, university perspective. I see Professor Tim Cassell is here in the room and we talk a lot, we're exploring a lot the concept of um, collective mindset. So it's part of research we are doing in collaboration with School of Psychology, Business School, Team Centre, looking at very different perspective on how we achieve that collective mindset. So there are quite a few research, exciting research initiatives to try and support this. But thank you very much for this, um, for this overview and the three very important points you've raised. Helen, so while we are talking about um, mineral supply, we always end up having discussion about production capacity. And the aim of today is not to make comments about each company's numbers and how they think it's going, but there's definitely concerns around production capacity, particularly on, on specific metals like copper. I know that we've had a lot of conversation about copper production in Chile and where it's heading. That would be one example. So we know there are projects in the pipeline to try and support uh, increase in production, but um, as far as we know, they may not start production until later this decade. So how can we meet rising demand in the longer term and minimise the risk of a mismatch in timing between demand and the industry's ability to bring on new projects? Thanks, Claire. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think one of the key things, first of all, is efficiency. I mentioned it before and it is a bit of a passion of mine. Making, and I don't just mean efficiency in the mining operation so that the company can make the most amount of money. I mean efficient use of resources, efficient use of, if we, if we are going to go and dig stuff up, then making sure that we make the best use and get the most out of every single gram of material, and we talk billions of tonnes of, of production, every single gram of material that we dig up needs to have a use and a place and, and then become what part of what Janelle was talking about in that circular economy and circular practices. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing, again, a, mind, a mindset shift. The ambassador in, in his speech just now um, spoke about the dig and chip model you know, being being the world's quarry and, and Latin America is a big producer of raw materials as a jurisdiction, Australia is exactly the same. We also joke about ourselves being the world's quarry. So we need to change that as well. We need to, again, we're not just digging stuff up. We're not even extracting all the metals. We're sending, in a lot of cases, we're sending ore and concentrate overseas for somebody else to do something with that. So instead of shipping huge volumes of stuff around, do the most that we can with it close to where it's mined, close to, to, the, to the source of that stuff out of the ground before then shipping on a more advanced product. So in both of our jurisdictions, we need to start looking at increased processing, increased manufacturing, and that requires a lot of government help. We don't just stand up an industry because we decide that we should, you know, that that would be the best thing that we need to do. So there's a huge amount of collaboration between industry and academia and, and government in making that happen. 
when we come back to, I want to come back to that point about efficiency. So I mentioned that my job is to find critical minerals in mine waste. That's what the company that I work for wants me to do. Janelle was talking about the, the work that the Queensland Government does with um, the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at UQ on characterising tailings so the, or other types of mine waste as well around Queensland. That program has actually grown from being just Queensland focused. Every other state in Australia wanted their piece of that pie as well because it was such a good idea because nobody spends money on understanding the waste. Why would you spend money on something that you consider to have no value? When in fact, if we look at uh, processing efficiency, so when we take the, dig the ore up out of the ground and we run it through a processing plant to get the metal out or to get some kind of intermediate product out, often we're only getting around 60 or 70 per cent of the metal out of the stuff that was actually dug up out of the ground. So there's actually, when we, we're thinking, you know, billions of tonnes of, of production at a mine, that's millions of tonnes, potentially even hundreds of millions of tonnes of ore, of metal, that we're not even using. We're throwing that in the waste. So there's a huge resource sitting at surface all around the world, all around Queensland, all around Australia, and I guarantee it, all around the different mining nations in, in Latin America, sitting at surface, it's already crushed, so it's a lot easier to go and get it. In a lot of cases, it contains sulphide material, which, when exposed to air and water, generates sulfuric acid, hence acid mine drainage. So we're creating, we're not using the stuff that we dig up efficiently, we're throwing away a lot of the metals that we actually need for the energy transition and we're creating environmental problems. So it's a lose, lose, lose all around. Making better use of that waste, spending a little bit more effort and perhaps a little bit more money on getting more out, reprocessing that mine waste, partnering with other companies who perhaps have processing capability that the original mining company doesn't have, generating a new business model where the waste is valued as an asset or viewed as an asset that somebody else can come in and reprocess. So it's something that I'm pretty passionate about um, and I could talk about it for hours actually. Yes. <laughs> um, but another aspect of that is not only in the primary, say a copper mine. We, you know, Latin America is, is, a, is renowned for copper. Australia, we have some very big copper mines here in Queensland as well. Um, cobalt, as an example, is a commonly occurs with copper. Uh, it also commonly occurs with nickel. Rare earths commonly occur with phosphorites that we use for um, products for fertilizer. There's, nature doesn't make things pure. It makes things a mixed up boiling pot of polymetallic goodness. And most minds don't, don't view that as their business model. They go in, they say, we, we are, there's a lot of copper here, we're going to mine the copper. Everything else, that's not our focus. Our shareholders don't want that. It's too hard to set up a processing plant to get all these different things out. So the rest of it goes to waste. So we might have 60 or 70% um, recovery for our copper or our nickel or whatever it is that we're focused on. But then there's actually 0% recovery of all the other stuff that's in there. And because technology has changed so very, very fast in the last 50 years, the things that we need now for our energy solutions are vastly different from the stuff that we needed a few decades ago, number one. And number two, um, the energy transition, all of the solutions associated that, with that are very, very metals intensive as compared to coal combustion, gas, you know, petrol um, powered cars. 
the other things that we need that are going to be cleaner actually require a huge amount more metal and they require a whole suite of different metals than what we have needed and used up till now. So a lot of the stuff that we need is in that waste. So I know in, here in Queensland, having been part of the, the programs that um, Janelle was talking about, that we have a huge cobalt endowment in our big copper mines here in Queensland. I know that the same can be said of some of the big copper mines over in Latin America. So let's go look at the tailings. Let's look at the stuff that was generated as waste and get more out of that. So I think the question was, should we just explore for more and, and dig more up? We are going to need to explore more. We need to recycle more. We, as each individuals, need to take all of our electronic stuff at home when it's end of, end of use. We need to make sure that that metal is recycled. That's our individual responsibility, but that's a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of metal that we are going to need in order to achieve our net zero ambitions. And so we need to be better at everything that we do and make sure that we apply maximum efficiency to every drop of or that we dig up out of the ground. Yeah, thank you, Helen. So even though we will probably see new mines, it is very important to focus on what we already have and getting efficiency from those deposits out there in tellings and waste material that provide a lot of value. Thank you. And Liliana, Helen was um, hinting at this lose-lose-lose situation when we have uh, environmental impacts that rise from current waste structures. But more broadly, you have a lot of experience exploring the potential environmental impact from the mining sector, particularly its potential impact on water resources. And you've done a lot of work in Latin America looking at exactly this topic. So here on this panel, we are talking about reliable supply of critical minerals. But for us, um, as environmental scientists, it also implies responsible supply of minerals. So in your view, what should we focus on to ensure that this race to decarbonisation does not yield environmental impact and environmental legacies that we absolutely want to avoid? Uh, thank you, Claire. Well, um, as you say, and we all know, mining is a very disruptive and intrusive activity that generates a lot of impacts, uh, environmental and social impacts. The mining industry is, is managing these impacts um, and it's doing better with time, but in my opinion, still very reactive. So it reacts and try to solve the impact after they happened. I think that with the mining of critical minerals, uh, we need to learn from this and um, be more proactive in how we manage these impacts, uh, that they will always happen. For that to happen, the mining industry needs to have a better management plans uh, from the start, a plan that includes all the life of mine and incorporates an analysis not only of the localized uh, site of the mine um, itself, but the region that the mine is part of, including also uh, cumulative impacts with other mines or other industries. They need to uh, invest in the development uh, and then incorporate a new technology um, that allows more efficient mining and, and less uh, mine waste, as uh, Helen was uh, mentioning. They need to use renewable uh, sources of energy and invest on reliable sources of water. And as in the case of arid regions that happen in Chile, where the mining area is, that involves, for example, um, um, investing in desalination plants. They need to also incorporate the surrounding communities in their plans, early consultation and constant communication and participation with the communities. I think this is the only way, uh, way that the mining industry will regain the trust um, from the communities and also the public in general. For all that to happen, I think uh, legislation needs to be stronger and demand, demand all of these things. But I also think that um, even if that, that doesn't happen, the public will um, require these things. Um, because good and proactive management and social, uh, of social and environmental impacts will be demanded by the public. I am currently participating in a project uh, where a very known uh, car manufacturer asked us to investigate the uh, social impacts and the social context of um, the region where the mine, lithium mining is happening. So 
because people are is now more aware of where things are coming from and it is demanding uh, more green uh, you know products so i think this also will contribute to a better uh, mining industry in the future Liliana, and interestingly, a lot of the things you're discussing go back to this concept of the multidisciplinary approach, the people working together and, and finding ways that we can do this more effectively. To go back to your initial point, Janelle, on this common um, understanding and common knowledge. Um, when it comes to assessing impact and environmental values, we need a lot of information, we need a lot of data. And I know we are all passionate about this issue of data management frameworks and the sort of information we need to support this reliable supply of critical minerals. Uh, Janelle, you've been leading the development of very complex data sets. So what else should we be targeting in terms of data acquisition and analysis to support this responsible and reliable supply of critical minerals? And a key question with this, I think, is how do we deliver nationally consistent data management framework? So we are doing quite a bit of work in Australia at the moment in figuring out how all these data um, work and how does it feed into systems that a lot of people can access. So we know, for instance, um, in both Latin America and in Australia, when you have a new project, you need to do an environmental impact study. That means you are in the field collecting a lot of data and then not much happens to that data. It sits in PDF reports. And then the next person who wants to do an EIS doesn't necessarily have access to that data. So what is the current view in geoscience, in Australia in general, around data management frameworks? And are there um, points we could be sharing with that Latin American colleague on that topic? Yeah, absolutely. The data management one is, is such an important question. We invest millions and millions of dollars in geoscience data acquisition. Companies invest billions. Like this is an amazing data asset that we have in geoscience. And you're right, other industries like geotechnical industry or environmental industries, although I'm not as familiar with them, they suffer from having to repeat data acquisition when they have to go back and investigate the same area. And so I think an understanding of the value of data and how we can make our data most accessible to all is a really important thing to consider, especially as government. So um, in the Australian geoscience community, we actually have um, a government geoscience information committee. It is uh, sourced from each of the state geological surveys and the federal geological survey. Um, and they come together and try and work out how to coordinate their efforts in terms of data delivery, data standards, vocabularies. So again, coming back to this shared language, if I have data in one format and someone has data potentially the same data in a different format, the barrier to entry of using their data can be sufficient that it's easier to go and recollect it. Right, and so it's a terrible efficiency problem. Again, efficiency is a problem. Um, so what, uh, what I think we can do is really, we have to get our technical professionals together. I think government has an outsized role to play in this field. So um, one of the more surprising mechanisms I've seen for effectively um, standardizing data formats and metadata formats across an industry is procurement, um, which is a very unsexy sort of thing to think about. But um, in the airborne magnetic geophysics space, there's only a few providers in the, in the Australian country and government is actually one of the major consumers of their services. And so in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, all the government agencies came together and said, well, we're getting data in different formats from these companies. It's not easy to work together um, with data from different companies. So why don't we, in our contracts, mandate that these are the standards that we expect to have delivered and this is um, how we're going to set the contract up. And it's not going to work immediately. Uh, it's going to take some time to bring the companies on board with these new standards. But because we're such a big consumer, we have the power to make these changes in the data space. And so it's happened in, you know, the magnetic data space. It's going to bleed out into geophysics more broadly. And then maybe there's a bigger role for procurement for government agencies to play in trying to bleed this out across other sectors because 
DES are an enormous organisation. The Department of Environment and Science in Queensland are a huge purchaser of goods. Transport and main roads, again, a huge purchaser of knowledge and data and information. And we can all have an impact by changing our expectations of the people who work for us. Yeah, thank you, Janelle. This is a very um, big challenge. And for our Latin American colleague, a bit of background about the situation in Australia where the state governments tend to maintain a lot of spatial data sets, but at state level, and we don't necessarily have a fantastic coordination of those spatial data sets at federal level. So there are a lot of activities looking at data models we could use um, to try and improve that flow of information from state to federal level and then back down again to the users. So there are of conversations happening and trying to establish that common um, shared knowledge again. And there are definitely a lot of um, fascinating uh, problems with the management of environmental data and water related data as well, particularly groundwater, where we know mining proponents would collect a lot of groundwater information, but that does not necessarily feed into, um, into the state-based or federal-based system. And in Latin America, we know there's an amazing skill set in hydrogeology and a lot of really in-depth understanding of hydrogeology at the scale of the mine, but I'm not quite sure how it works then at the scale of Chile or at the scale of Bolivia and how this flow of information occurs. So it's a real, um, uh, a lot of activities at the moment and will require data scientists and will require various people to talk to each other. So it is quite a fascinating space to be in at the moment. And Helen, we've been talking about, you know, the critical metal and increasing potentially production, but what we think we know um, is declining ore grades, really. So that seems to be the accepted view. And Professor Valente is famous for his graphs showing with the demand that we have and the ore grade that we are predicting or that we know of, this is the waste volumes that we are going to be generating. So yes, we can get more efficiency out of the waste we currently have, but what is the future of waste volumes we will be generating through that supply of critical minerals? What are we going to do with it? And what's the role of processing options in this? So we know for a given metal, a given ore body, there might be different options for processing, which might have different requirements for water. So how does that fit into the picture for this supply of critical minerals? I know that's a difficult topic. <laughs> Let's do our best. <laughs> well, we can't shy away from difficult topics, no. can we? So, um, yes, no, absolutely true that globally the, the ore deposits that we do know about in the ground, um, when we find more, they tend to be lower grade, so less copper for the same amount of volume. So then that means we need to dig more to get the same amount of copper. So we're generating more waste and, and Rick does have a, a set of diagrams showing how quickly we're going to globally fill up um, Sydney Harbour, I think once every 25 days by 2050 or something with, with mine tailings. Um, so that's a huge volume of waste and, and globally I think mining is the largest generator of waste of any industry. So when we, when we talk about, you know, recycling industries... Not a lot of people actually talk about where is the largest amount of waste and, and what can we do with that and how can we make that better. So, again, being more efficient, finding uses for every single scrap of that. If we, if we are going to have to dig it up, um, then we get the metal out. Okay, so we've done some, some processing magic. We, we've increased the efficiency of metal extraction and then we're, le we're still left with a large volume of material. It may no longer be acid forming, it might now be more inert. Is there another use that we can use, that we can put that waste to? Can we, can we create construction material? You know, or can we, do we just use it to remediate the land and, and turn it back to, to something close to what it was beforehand? Is that the best use of that land? Or rather, we're seeing things in, in Australia now with um, old mining pits being used for hydroelectricity projects or a water source for a local community because there's a big hole there and it's going to fill up with water if the water is clean enough. You know, can, can that be used for a local... So understanding not only the volume of waste that's going to be produced but the actual um, land surface that we are left with, is it... Um, 
the, is the best use of that to, to remediate it completely and, and turn it back into some sort of pasture land or is there a better use for that in terms of energy generation through hydroelectricity or uh, water storage against drought, perhaps um, water storage for, for fish, you know, the, the um, fisheries and, and that sort of thing or just a community water space that they can use for recreation. So there's, there's multiple ways to start looking at end of life and at the end of a mine life. Um, but coming back to your original question, because I feel like I've diverted a little bit, I don't have clever notes like the other ladies. Um, the, um, there are other ways, other technologies that are starting to come to the fore as well where we don't even need to, when we discover a new ore body, we don't even need to actually dig it up. So we in situ processing or in situ leaching is what it's called, um, where we can inject some chemicals basically down into the ground that will dissolve the metals out of the ground without us having to dig anything up and then the, the water circulation would be sort of pumped in from one end and, and then drawn up. And of course, some very, very clever hydrologists would have to be involved in that to make sure that it all goes the right way, and, and that is beyond my skill set. But, but that doesn't come without risks either. You know, we we already see how unpopular and justifiably so the fracking industry is here in Queensland, and that's essentially the same thing: injecting stuff down through a drill hole so that you can push the the gas or the oil or whatever it is that they're after you know, in a particular direction and extract it from another place. So there are, there are solutions to, um, to extraction without generating waste at the surface, but, um, but they, are, they are still fraught with issues. So either we, well, I don't think it's an either or, I think there's a combination of a huge amount of communication and understanding of local communities to say this is this is what we are doing and this is what the implications are and this is everything that we're doing to mitigate any risks but then also keep working at that technology keep making it better and that's where we have our you know the the fantastic collaborations between U, UQ here in Queensland and SMI ICE over in in Chile you know that collaboration many many brains are better than one <laughs> And so I know that the, the processing brains and, and those technology brains um, at the various sister campuses of the Sustainable Minerals Institute are working on some of those things as well. So there are always new ways of doing things, but when we talk about waste, there also needs to be an appetite for risk um, in terms of perhaps getting to a better outcome, but pushing through some things first so we can get there. It is still very important to focus on mineral processing options and just to try and push the envelope and continue to do so to try and minimise volume or requirement for and water. That, and that's why really yeah. I've started out my life as an exploration geologist yeah. and now I am more in the processing end because I feel like there is so much more that we can do at that end than just going out, finding more stuff for us to dig up and ship out. We can do better. And you mentioned this issue of pits containing water that could potentially be a resource and indeed. So we've talked a lot about characterising waste and trying to extract critical minerals out of this, but we find they are really, um, this ha appears in mine water at times as well. So there's also a need to look at what we can do with that water and instead of just letting it sit in a pit to try and recover some rare earth elements or, or critical metals out of it and then produce a product, uh, a, a type of water that can be reused for other purposes. So there's quite, there are activities in there as well. So it's not just the waste, it's the water as well. And as we know, they go together. Um, now, um, in terms of critical um, minerals, lithium is attracting a lot of attention, particularly because it goes in cars. So everybody's quite excited about that prospect. So Liliana, um, you've been doing a lot of work in the so-called lithium triangle, which is a zone that straddles Chile, Ar Argentina and Bolivia. Um, and this is quite different from the things we've been discussing today because it's not hard rock mining in this area. Explain to us how they extract lithium in this part of the world, Liliana. Um, 
Yes, thank you, Claire. Well, lithium, the lithium triangle has um, the largest known uh, resource reserves in the world. And uh, as you said, Claire, it is contained in brine and not in hard rock. Um, you can say that extracting lithium from brine is a bit easier than extracting it from hard rock, um, we, because extracting it from hard rock is very energy intensive. Uh, to extract lithium from brine, uh, you, the brine is pumped out uh, into evaporation ponds. Um, the brine remains there for a very, very long time, uh, months, until it reached a desired uh, um, concentration. Then this is pumped out again uh, to extract the lithium. Uh, usually this extraction is done elsewhere. Um, water is the most important environmental uh, consideration in this type of lithium extraction. Uh, it has been estimated that for, on average half a million liters are evaporated uh, per ton of lithium carbonate. Uh, and and you, as you all know, the lithium triangle is a very, uh, very arid region. On top of that, all that water lost into the atmosphere and um, the, the brine extraction itself can draw down water levels in the area, affecting the availability of uh, fresh water that's already very scarce in the region. Brine extraction can change the chemistry of the brines um, that affects the equilibrium that maintains the life in these uh, systems. Um, and we can also impact the, uh, we can also have we also have the impacts of the water the fresh water that's needed for the final process of extracting the lithium it, it itself water is also the connection between the environmental impacts and the social impacts um, in this area because of the connection of the communities that live in this area um, with these catchments uh, with these water resources and the flora and fauna they, they sustain <laughs> So, um, yes, yeah, so the lithium is easier in, from the technical perspective, but it has a lot of um, environmental and social considerations that we need to look after, yeah. How do we um, evaluate those, those challenges uh, in a place where you've got three countries that are involved in this area? So, into, you know, we've been talking about data management frameworks at the scale of one country. So what does that mean when we have three countries working together on this particular extraction problem? What, what kind of challenges do we have? Yeah, well, it is very challenging. We were involved in a project, as I said, looking at the lithium triangle as, as a whole area. And there is a huge disparity in available data. Um, there is more data available in Chile. I, th I guess it's because lithium uh, mining is more developed in Chile. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, information about the Sala de Atacama, especially. Um, but still, um, there is no consensus of how this groundwater brine system really works. So it's even if there is more data there, there's a lot of uncertainties, and we cannot know for sure the impacts of the lithium extraction. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Argentina and Bolivia, um, yeah, we couldn't really... Argentina is a bit better in terms of uh, finding available data, freely available data, I'm saying. I'm not... Because we, we were not... Um, went, we, didn't went, we didn't go to Argentina to looking for data. But it was a bit more difficult, and in the case of Bolivia, it's, it's, it was less uh, available data to us to work with. Yeah. And Helen was mentioning this focus on new technologies that is part of the conversation. Is there anything uh, related to lithium extraction where a specific new technologies that might be arising and assist with that process? Yes, there is. Um there's been a lot of research lately in an alternative to these evaporitic methods. Um, they are called direct lithium extraction or DLE uh, technologies. Uh, these technologies aim to tackle the environmental um, and, and techno-economic shortcomings of uh, the current method by avoiding brine evaporation and making it a lot shorter. We're talking from months to days on extracting the lithium. But these technologies are still in, in very early stages of testing and experimenting. Um, some of them are very uh, energy intensive um, or, or require a, a lot of fresh water that's not really, it's not really been quantified. Um, so, or, or use a lot of chemicals to, to you know, separate the lithium from the brine. So there is a lot of uncertainties um, in these technologies yet, but um, I see them as a as a way forward to see if we are, we can do it better with the lithium extraction from brine. 
Thank you, Liliana. So this has been a fascinating conversation and we're almost drawing to a, clo to a close, but given the range of topics we've discussed, I can't help thinking that we're going to need to find other ways to support market resilience. Does anyone have a final comment to make about this topic? And I'm sure it might be explored later today. Um, any views on that? Yeah. Market resilience. Um, I think that collaboration uh, is the key to to any form of resilience. So going going further together. Um, when it comes to the critical minerals supply chains, one of the reasons why they are critical is because of the political nature, the, the geopolitics that's overlaid on those supply chains where certain jurisdictions around the world become um, dominant in that supply and if there is any political tension, which there often is, between you know, China, for example, or Russia um, and the Western world, then those supply chains have the potential to become quite disrupted and, and there is a huge amount of political risk associated with the supply of those raw materials into the industrial um, or the, the manufacturing industries of, of downstream nations. We've already mentioned how the Latin American jurisdiction in Australia tend to be, we're mining jurisdictions, we dig stuff up and we ship it out. Um, there is a lot of lithium in, in parts of, of Latin America. There's also a lot of copper. In Australia, we have also some lithium, we have some rare earths, we have copper as well. But if we, if we took a collaborative approach, which I think is the goal of conversations today, to say, um, we, we, are, we are key suppliers together, you know, Australia and Latin America, of critical minerals into Europe, into North America, into, you know, parts of Asia. Um, and, to, and rather than being competitors, we look for ways to collaborate in a, in a joint product. You know, we have, between us, we have everything that could possibly be required for any type of battery any type of energy solution that the world needs. So if we work together to present that united front and, and create a, a, a joint market rather than being competitors, I think that that is one way to ensure very, very resilient supply and, and resilient markets and, um, and secure the, the wealth and, and you know, economic benefits and social benefits that, that could go along with that as well for both of our jurisdictions. Thank you, Helen. Daniel, did you want to comment? We've got one minute. No? <laughs> um, I, I think Helen's put it fabulously, to be honest. I think um, from my point of view, understanding how the government supports that is the most important thing that we can do as government organisations. What things can we put in place to de-risk some of these commercial operations? As the ambassador said, sometimes government can be a bit disconnected from industry, which is a very polite way of saying sometimes we are not very good at listening to the needs of our community. Sometimes we're not nimble enough to move and adapt to these new technologies, these new requirements. And so we are trying to work out how we do that inside government. I don't think we have an answer yet, but I think collaboration, coordination, it's, it's always the key. Thank you for those final remarks. And that brings our, our wonderful panel discussion to a close. And we, I, we, we have a, we have to, we actually have a couple of minutes left according okay. to our schedule. And we have a couple of questions, questions online right. that, that, um, um, that you were going to read briefly. Thank you. So one of the questions we have online is how do new and innovative solutions for reprocessing abandoned mine areas for tailings fit in the Latin American and or Australian environmental policy frameworks? Do you think that companies will invest more if there are more incentives? Thank you. Well, Helen or Chanel? <laughs> uh, although I can't speak for the Latin American um, regulatory frameworks in, in the different, and there's you know, a large number of, of countries represented there. Um, I know my experience in Australia is that uh, our regulatory frameworks are not well set up to facilitate um, 
reprocessing of mind waste, we tend to look at things in a very linear way. We find something, we dig it up, we make a pile of waste, the metal goes off overseas somewhere, um, and then we put a clay cap or, or some other form of remediation over the waste so that hopefully the acid that we've generated doesn't leak out into the environment and then we just kind of watch that for the next 100 or so years to, and hope that it doesn't leak, you know. <laughs> um, so that's, that's not an ideal scenario, but that is how our regulatory framework has been constructed around, um, around that process. So... Uh, the the idea of returning something as close to the original um, land form or the original state of the of the land as possible is is always the goal for our Department of Environment and Science here in Queensland. Whereas what we're seeing is solutions like I spoke of before, finding other uses which are not environmentally da damaging. Um, where that environmental risk has been removed because we've, you know, reprocessed all the stuff out of it and, and made it better and more inert, but then using all that material and being left with a, a hole in the ground is viewed by the Envi Department of Environment as not an ideal scenario, whereas a lot of communities would actually um, like to see that then as a resource that they can use. For, for, for the local community, for energy, for water, you know, all that sort of thing. So there's, there's I think we need to work on flexibility within the re regulatory framework. Um, and I mentioned very briefly an appetite for risk. So if we've, if we've got an old abandoned site um, where, you know, the, the company has, has gone bust, the, the state government steps in to take responsibility for that site and ensure that environmental harm and, and environmental damage is managed and remediated. Um, but then we come in 20, 50 years later and go, well, that was an old copper mine and now we actually want all the... We know that all the cobalt was put in that waste and we want to go and, and get that cobalt. To remove the cap on the old tailing stem is there, you, you're going to have a spike in your risk profile. You're going to see an increase in risk while we re-expose that area to the environment and, and re-disturb it to dig it up, whilst at the very, very end of that reprocessing activity, we're going to leave it better than it was before because we're going to take out some of the stuff that the cap is there to protect against in the first place. But... Um, but we, we need to develop some, some industry government appetite for shared risk while we go and redisturb old areas that, you know, they're not ideal, they're leaking acid, they're, they're a huge drain on taxpayer money while the government, you know, goes in every couple of years to recap, to rehabilitate, to do all of that kind of thing. They're costing money and they're doing no good, but to reprocess them is going to have in the short term an increased risk for then longer term gain and a better outcome. So sharing that, that understanding of risk or, you know, or another scenario, so much to talk about in this topic, sorry. Um, another scenario is an abandoned site, but um, it's being managed by the department. A small, because it's always small companies, not the big, not the Rio Tintos, not the BHPs that want to go into an abandoned site and have a look at what might be still there. A small company goes in to say, we can, we can reprocess and we can clean this up, but who owns all the historical liability, which can run into the hundreds of millions of dollars and, and be the liability on that area can be larger than the market cap of the junior company that wants to go in and do something with it. So there's a real barrier, there's a cost barrier to, to being able to go and do that activity, which will have good outcomes for the environment, for the community and for our, you know, metals production. But um, bickering and arguments about who owns the, the historical liability doesn't help the end solution. So, again, I think there's a role for government in, in that. Thank you very much. Um, no more questions? Okay, well... Je Oh, do we have time for one in the room? Just oh, briefly. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, g'day. Interesting topic 
Um, so the Mount Morgan mine, um, the reason they were able to overcome the issue that you talk about is something called a phase two agreement. And of the 120 major abandoned mines in Queensland, I think it was the only one that had one of these phase two agreements which effectively insulated the new proponent from the old risk. So I suppose Department of Resources and Department of Environment and Science, my recommendation is to really go to school on the difference that that um, basically limitation of risk made for a small miner to adopt the risk. And very importantly for lenders, they're not going to fund a, an abandoned mine and a reprocessing operation without one of those because the risk profile is so high. So I think there is a solution already, it just hasn't been replicated. I'm not sure if there's other examples of that elsewhere in Australia, but that's a really live one there in... Are, there are a number in Tasmania, so they're, but they're all very, very site-specific, whereas what I'm talking about is a more um, overall approach, a consistent overall approach rather than one one site at a time. But I agree, you know, yeah. when, we, when we get down into it, we can come up with solutions for sure. Very topically, uh, you were mentioning lithium in Latin America. Um, the Queensland company Asenco was taken over by um, US investors on Friday um, and they've announced that it's a mining engineering processing company. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from Asenco here um, for about $900 million with the sole focus of doing lithium in Latin America. I thought that was really interesting that US investors investing in an Australian company to go to Latin America on lithium. Yes, thank you. And just on that topic of um, of risk um, and regulatory issues, the Office of the Queensland's Mine Rehabilitation Commissioner, they are exploring something called sandboxing, where we just draw a boundary around your little project, your little um, uh, concept, proof of concept, uh, with that um, taking over all the regulatory aspects so that you can explore what could potentially be happening. So th they're definitely exploring potential options to broaden that approach. Thank you. Sorry, we went around, huh? Sorry. So, Janelle, Liana and Helen, thank you so much for your engaging conversation and, all your no and sharing all your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much to, uh, to, to Claire and, and, and the panel. Um, and I guess you always want to have a panel that, that finishes with a, with a backlog of questions that didn't get, have a chance to get answered. And I guess the good thing is the Padlet is going to remain open, um, and the panelists will certainly have a look at the questions that are there and uh, and try to provide answers to them. I I can't I can't avoid commenting on the uh, you know the lack of a shared language, which I think is a really Im uh, valid and important thing to to mention. And I was thinking about community perceptions of mining, and we should start calling instead of calling them ore deposits or mines, we should call them mixed up boiling pots of polymetallic goodness, which is how, how Helen turned them. And I think that would make a big, big uh, difference to community perceptions of mining perhaps. And uh, now's, the, now's the time um, where, where I'd like to invite Ms. Namalee Mackay to present the keynote address. So most recently, Namalee led the critical minerals agenda for the Australian uh, um, Trade and Investment Commission, Austrade, in London, where she worked with UK and Australian critical minerals stakeholders on behalf of the Australian government. Following Brexit, Namalee was trade advisor to Make UK, the UK's largest manufacturing industry body, where she worked with UK manufacturers on supply chain and trade strategies for Brexit readiness. Namalee is a former Australian diplomat and trade negotiator covering the trade, industry, resource and climate portfolios during her posting at the Australian High Commission in London. And after her posting, Namalee was appointed Group Head of International Relations at Prudential PLC UK in London, where she managed the group's trade and international agenda across the ASEAN region. Um, Anomaly has returned to Australia and is the founder and managing director of the newly formed Critical Minerals Association of Australia. And most importantly, of course, she's a UQ alumnus. Um, so welcome, Anomaly. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, now let me just... Move forward. Yeah, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. And um, as Rick said, I am a former UQ um, 
student, I guess. And I actually graduated in 1994. So if you do the maths there, I'm pretty old. <laughs> um, so it's been a long time because I've been, you know, overseas for a long time since I've been here. But yeah, a real pleasure to, to be speaking to you all. And um, what I'm actually proposing to speak to you about today is um, critical minerals as a um, tool of economic statecraft. So I'm just going to have a sort of big picture view of of the critical minerals industry globally and kind of share with you why we um, came into existence in the Critical Minerals Association. So the first thing to say, and I think Rick alluded to it, is that I'm not a geologist, like my the esteemed panel before me, and I'm not a chemical engineer. Um, I, yeah, I am a former diplomat and a trade negotiator, and I and I guess I do understand the geopolitics of this area, and that's you know that's exactly why I wanted to just touch on that aspect. Um, with you today and I also wanted to caveat that I'm not a Latin American <laughs> specialist either but I'm obviously in this role very aware of the contribution that Latin America makes to the critical min minerals industry um, more globally. Um, so I'm going to actually go back a bit and just talk to you about the basics of critical minerals and and um, why is it so geopolitically significant and and to give you a picture of where Australia sits in that in that landscape and um, and I think I think that former panel really alluded to the similarities between Latin America and Australia's big global suppliers of critical minerals and um, and I think you know, it might just leave you with some thoughts about where Latin America and Australia have similarities and differences in that whole um, global space. So, um, I mean, you you may have heard, you know, so many explanations of what a critical mineral is and why it's critical, but I am going to sort of talk about it again because... Um, uh, it, it's it's all of it, it's a lot about geopolitics. I mean, you can see from my slide there that you know you've got the classic definition of why is it a critical mineral? It's because it's often got these three factors where it's either you know limited and concentrated in its supply, um, and you can't easily substitute it or diversify from it. it and, and most importantly, it's, it's in a vulnerable situation. That supply chain either has a geopolitical risk attached to it or economic um, vulnerability attached to it, makes it highly um, difficult to access through the supply chain, or, um, it, particularly in the case of Australia, the US and other nations, it's strategically important to our sovereign um, security, I guess, is, is one of the reasons it's deemed to be critical. So um, the thing is that every country is defining what a critical mineral is slightly differently. And um, here in Australia, we have about 26 critical minerals on the designated national list. Um, but it's actually under review at the moment. So, you know, you'll see a lot of people lobbying for copper to be on the list or another mineral to be on the list. And um, and as, as I've set out here, you know, these minerals underpin and, and I think I was having a conversation with our new TIQ rep just in coffee and he was saying, you know, um, why, you know, why and how do they contribute to the energy energy transition and the, the reason is because we are now demanding all of these electric vehicles and wind turbines and solar panels and these these minerals are now what are you know driving and are needed for that change and they are very um, vulnerable in terms of their supply and and the geopolitical tensions that surround them um so I, I just wanted to give you a sense of us and how we came to be because it's very much part of that geopolitical scene setting. Um, the Critical Minerals Association is actually international and we have a international alliance, Critical Minerals International Alliance is sort of an umbrella body that sits globally and it's it's it talks a bit to some of the themes we discussed earlier about that shared language and, um, sh you know, coordination and, and driving 
countries to work together. So there's at the moment there's we are set up here in Australia, in um, the UK, which is where it actually started, in the US and in Canada as well. And the idea behind it is that we are like-minded nations having a conversation about how we secure critical mineral supply chains around the world and um, collaborate and coordinate with each other globally to um, to actually overcome some of these vulnerable bottlenecks. So that's, that's kind of how we came to be. Um, here in Australia, um, we're, we're actually quite new, I think, as Rick um, alluded to. So we we set up a year and a half ago here and our aim is to be a very unique platform just for critical minerals industries that are very focused on some of the things that we've already discussed this morning, the, the primary pillar being ESG um, and being really committed to getting it right, um, doing it differently and not being you know, fossil fuel based in in essence, but also looking at how can we encourage this industry in Australia to operate differently and to diversify into other international kind of supply chains than the what the traditional model that's that we're working with now. So we very much are bringing the industry together and really working with government, um, governments here and governments na uh, internationally to, to I guess, to um, bring the industry together. It's a very disparate industry. Um, a lot of you will know there's, you know, juniors, majors, um, a range of commodities, and it, th there, are, there is often a quite a bit of difference, but there's also common commonality in the issues that they face. So that's very much us. Um, one of the things about our association is that we aren't just about miners and explorers. So we really have been determined to bring in um, ESG specialists, um, provenancing, you know, mine to magnet scientists, um, critical minerals data specialists, so that we can build the industry in Australia in a way that you're having a holistic conversation. It's not just about mining and exploring. It's about bringing... Um, miners, refiners and others into a bigger picture conversation. So, um, so yeah, so that's a little about us. Um, now, the reason I've got this picture of all a few of our leaders up there is, is actually just to talk about um, the kind of mix of people that we see in our associations. We've deliberately made the decision to have people like me and um, where we have that geopolitical lens in, in our leadership positions and then we are supported by a team of geos and chemical engineers and that I think speaks to the nature of the critical minerals industry it's, is that it's highly complex, complex in in the technicalities as, as you would have witnessed from some of the panellists earlier but also the geopolitical complexities that um, that it faces internationally. And so, um, and in fact, our, our um, US CEO, he's um, Puerto Rican and has a, and, and is, is very um, passionate about South America. And, and we've had uh, requests to <laughs> expand to Japan, to South Korea and South America, which is our ambition in our sort of next tier. And um, those three regions we see as, as, very important in forming that that international network. Um, and some of you may have heard of the Minerals Security Partnership. So, you know, the US, Canada, all of these like-minded countries have formed together at the government level to have conversations exactly like, you know, the ones I'm talking about. And we want to be um, the industry counterpart to have, you know, to those conversations to bring the international supply chain um, to be more aligned effectively. Um, so I won't, I, won't, um, I won't go into it too much, but I, well, I guess one of the things I wanted to touch on is what the Australian industry has, is asking for. So we consulted very extensively across the critical minerals industry and what 
we found some of the biggest issues that they want to see in moving this industry into a new place is very much obviously just having that unique platform but also um, I think Helen you touched on it too about just the need to, to get out of this dig and ship model um, which South America may also you know be having a very similar um, conversation about where we want to move downstream to refine closer uh, and process closer to where we're extracting. And that comes with a whole set of challenges that are quite unique to this sector. Um, so that's something we're focused on. ESG, I can't stress enough, um, across all of our um, all of our associations. And what we've found is that it's um, it's a uh, I don't want to use the word minefield, but it's a um, you know it's it's a huge hugely complex space um, ESG and and we're not we're nowhere near there um, we're nowhere near there I think Janelle you said that too um, we have a long way to go and we have all of in the northern hemisphere what we see is this huge demand for responsible sourcing um, and production of the end product that's gone from either mine to magnet or mine to electric vehicle. But there is a lot to do to get the entire supply chain to meet that demand. Um, so, so, so that's one of it. And then the, I guess the other important thing that industry is really grappling with in Australia is finance and risk. So we have all these amazing projects in a, a range of commodities that cannot get finance. They're deemed as too risky. Um, the financial markets can't deal with them like they do with traditional commodities and that's a massive challenge in terms of here we are desperately trying to get these electric vehicles set up and we just can't get these mines um, at the supply and up and running and um, you know ready for production in time to meet that demand so um so that's um that's that's basically you know what we're we're on about here um I just want you to have a look at this. I mean, you may have seen different versions of this, um, of this, of these slides, but the energy transition is—it's um, very much um, looking at the demand, demand and supply of critical minerals, and you know. I think I've touched on it before. All of these um, supply and demand elements are are going into this new energy transition. And so um, I've actually just realised I've got the wrong slide here. <laughs> That's why I'm fumbling. Um, but, yeah, this, this, this slide is very much about, you know, what are the end uses and what are the commodities that are going into it? Um, and you can see there that um, some of those end uses and some of the demand that we have coming up over time is just exponentially increasing. Um, so, like South America, you know, Australia operates predominantly in the in the in the up, uh, up uh, upstream. This this is a, just a diagram of the traditional supply chain, which a lot of you may be familiar with. Um, you know, you have your exploration, your processing, your end products, and then you've got that ecosystem of contributors outside. Now, what's changing about the supply chain now is that you've got end users going directly to the mine, mining end, supply end, and, you know, uh, developing relationships at the, at the supply end. And so that traditional supply chain is now no longer just operating in that model. You know, we have interaction throughout the supply chain and that's quite um, challenging, you know, for, for, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and the, and now I just really want to come to the crux <laughs> crux of of the entire critical minerals industry, and that's entirely about the midstream. And it's most relevant to countries like Australia and and Latin American countries too, be, because we are huge suppliers of um, critical minerals, and we want to move into this midstream. Um, how we all want to play in that same playground. How do we do it? How do we collaborate? How do we not 
compete and not compete, but also how do we deal with the situation that this slide shows you, which is that China dominates the entire midstream. And and that's there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, that's just the, the way things are at the moment, but it places countries like Australia and potentially South America in a very vulnerable situation where there's no alternatives to diversify their supply and supply to. Um, and and I just want to take a, a moment to reflect on China and um, and how this has come to be because China does effectively monopolise that midstream um, in, in, in many critical minerals um, production and supply chains around the world. And, um, and it's fundamentally due to decades of foresight on their part and, uh, and really understanding the role of critical minerals and in a way that the Western world just did not. Um, you know, what we're looking at here is that China actually started opening up back in, you know, under Deng Xiaoping in the 1970s and, um, and embarked on this journey of capturing the midstream. It was a huge long-term plan um, that started, you know, a, a long time ago. And um, I'll just stay back on this slide. And, you know, of interest, like, I don't know if you recall um, one of the Chinese premiers, um, Wen Jiabao, he was actually a geologist um, and, you know, right through his entire career, if you have a look at it, he, like, brought this this whole critical minerals movement in China with him as he ascended through the Chinese Communist Party. And so this was a, a massively strategic um, geopolitical, political move and a huge amount of foresight whereas in the west we we had the complete opposite um uh thing going on we were we were closing down manufacturing we we're moving out of critical mineral or any kind of mining production and we were were going the other way so what we have now is a situation where we are fundamentally quite vulnerable as a supplying country um and, and this is the case in Australia and I presume also in, in Latin America as well. Um, so one of the things um, that I, I haven't um, got a slide for but I wanted to touch on is that part of this geopolitical tension, what we're seeing is also increasing nationalisation. And um, that's something that actually all of my um, South American colleagues will be very familiar with um, because obviously China does it in a different way but there is this movement around the world to nationalise critical minerals, um, commodities, their production and their supply. Now the benefit I guess of that that a lot of countries will see is that, you know, it stabilises the... Um, domestic production so that in theory they can you know you can pass on all those benefits from that industry to the whole country however it does come at a cost and and um and that cost you know it makes it very risky for investors to come into countries where the where the where the government owns all of those assets it it um increases their the, the esg focus doesn't tend to to come out or have the co competitive advantages where you can have new technology come in, best practice, and, and it tends to attract monopolistic investors. And, and China is a very good example where they've developed that amazing monopoly and they do tend to go in and invest in countries where, where there, there may be other state-owned um, so enterprises. So, um, I mean, here in Australia, we're trying to redefine what we're doing as a critical minerals industry and we're really trying to reshape the Australian industry to, um, to, to, to lead on ESG, to really move downstream, to really diversify with the partners that we work with and, um, and very much to lower our reliance on fossil fuels as, as our main kind of energy source. Um, and I think one of the things that's crucial to this is government support. And um, I think the other panel also touched on it that, you know, without government support, this industry 
cannot flourish and compete with that kind of monopoly market situation that's happening in the world. Um, and so you would you will have seen you know the U.S. with its uh, Inflation Reduction Act and and other big forms of support and Canada have come out and decided okay we're going to put a lot of money tax incentives into this industry and really build it up fast and the Australian government is also trying to do um, something similar but there is there's a massive gap there between how we can um, get there in time and it, it is very much a race against the clock and that that makes puts a lot of pressure on things like ESG where you don't you know we don't want to be cutting corners where, as we're doing it but government support is absolutely key and also key for these projects will not get financing um, unless the government you know backs it in some in some way um, so I guess this just really comes back to, um, you know, how do we build these responsible supply chains? And um, and and my slide here is is very much about collaboration. Um, we are there's we cannot compete with China on price. Um, none none of these countries can, and so we have to look at other ways of how critical mineral supply chains can actually flourish in countries like South America and Australia and across the world and the only way we can really do it is um, is is if we actually collaborate um, and and that's because of China's dominance in this in this sector so we, we, we genuinely need to figure out um, what strengths we bring what, where we can operate in the midstream together. And one of the things I wanted to touch on was the education piece because it is one of our, the pillars that we, uh, we're trying to bring together a group of academics who will work in this, um, work specifically on critical minerals together in this sector because for all of the reasons, the education piece is huge for so many so many um, different reasons. One, I mean, the others talked about it. The supply, the supply of skills into this sector is greatly lacking in Australia. But also, um, you know, we've seen courses closing down around the world in the northern hemisphere as well. Geoscience courses and engineering courses that are niche have come come to a halt. So that part of the education piece is important, but also the public facing education about mining and critical minerals and bringing the next generation with us because that generation has a very, very different approach to mining and resources than um, the one that we grew up with here in Australia. And th there's a, a huge disconnect there that we feel we have a responsibility to, to um, bring together effectively. And, um, and similarly, our education um education itself you know internationally is vitally important in terms of collaborating to have that conversation about how we do it you know do it together so i'm actually going to just stop there and and open up for a bit of a discussion um but essentially please do get in touch at any time um and i i i strongly encourage you to to think about this sector from a geopolitical lens and and our objective is very much to collaborate with other countries and to, for Australia to really lead that charge in terms of being a responsible producer being um innovative in moving down the supply chain and working with like-minded partners like South America and our other Western allies and Asian partners to actually solve some of these crucial problems that are occurring in critical mineral supply chains. But thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Damali. We, um, we've we've um, we've gone through most of the time for questions but i think it'd be really great to have a have a couple um so so um you know thanks again it was a, it was an excellent talk really interesting there are a couple of staff with microphones if anybody in the room has a question um or um if you're online i've got the padlet here in front of me so i was i was at the minerals week meeting in canberra uh, a couple of weeks ago um where 
the the, uh, the the chair of Tesla gave a really compelling talk about how Australia had this enormous opportunity to develop a, a downstream battery manufacturing um, industry, um, and 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 that we had to seize it and and support manu battery manufacturers in, in much in a way that you set out. And then the chair of the Productivity Commission stood up and said, it's okay that we're number 93 in terms of the complexity of our economy um, and that we've we've actually done very well economically on the strength of resource production. We should keep going the same way. And I know this is a very Australian question, but it's very much a question that applies to a lot of the resource production um, countries in, in Latin America as well. Um, I didn't come away from that from that meeting with a strong feeling that the government was going to make any sort of serious effort to support a downstream industry in Australia, but I'd be interested to hear your take on that. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, how, the government is says it's very committed to that. Um, and I think, you know, it's, we we would have some views on how it could be done differently and and i think one of the things is it's great to have a battery industry in australia but we we're, we're up here you know there is a massive supply chain and a hugely complex supply chain in between and there's a set of skills in that supply chain we just don't have in this country as well to the to the level so i think that's why i focused on the midstream you know we need to go step by step we can't just go to the end that's one thing and i i would tend to agree with you um rick like the government will be forced to do more because um what we're dealing with here is a massive market failure it's not a level playing field in the world australia cannot and south america cannot compete equally um, when you have a monopolistic situation, I mean, it's just economics that that th there will be price, you know, fluctuations, manipulations, all kinds of things that you can't do as a tiny little cobalt blue um, out in the market. So it will not work. And so in that market failure situation, that is one of the ways in which government has to really think about how can we strategically intervene and support the industry and ideologically in the west we're not used to doing that we hate it we're like we can't intervene we can't pick winners we can't um do that so this is this is a major issue for the government to have to look in the mirror and say how are we gonna how are we gonna get out of this situation with the time bomb that we're dealing with and so i'm not surprised that you came away with that feeling <laughs> Th thanks very much. And uh, unless there are any other burning questions, um, please join me in thanking Namalee for a fascinating keynote. And uh, I have to apologize because I was personally responsible for running us five minutes over by asking that final question, but but uh, but I'm, I'm not sorry. Um, so now, what I'd like to do is invite Professor Tim Castell, who's the director of the Andrew Liveris Academy for Innovation and Leadership, to moder moderate our second panel session, um, which is more focused on that journey to, to net zero opportunities and challenges for Australia and Latin America amidst the global push towards renewables and zero carbon commodities. So thanks very much, Tim. morning. Uh, buenas noches to those that are dialing in from Chile. Um, the Padlet, sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah, you, Tim. Yeah. The Padlet will be operating for the second panel as well. So please, uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions or comments, please add them into the Padlet. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Back to you. Um, all right. So, uh, so we'll follow a really similar format to the first, to the first panel. So I'll invite, it's a very esteemed panel. Um, their bios are very long and filled with many, many accomplishments, and I encourage you to check out those bios in the in the program. Uh, but I'll I'll, inter I'll I'll invite people up, um, and and we'll just talk a little bit about background in that first round of questions, rather than go through the whole bit. Uh, so the first person on our panel today um, is His Excellency Jaime Chamale, who's the ambassador of Chile. So thank you. So yeah, probably there. Yep. Uh, second, we have Dr. Juliana Segura-Salazar, 
who's a research fellow uh, here at UQ at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Isabel Franco, who is the founder and executive director of uh, IBF, the International Institute for Better Futures. And uh, the fourth panelist is uh, Daniel Nieto, who is a petroleum engineer and senior consultant uh, for Arch Energy. Uh, Uh, so, like I said, we'll we'll, we'll start with a very brief um, three-minute uh, intros um, from each of the panelists, just talking about um, basically why why you're here and why this is a good topic for you to be uh, to to be speaking on. Uh, so, we'll start with with Jaime first. Yes. Ah, Bueno, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to participate in this colloquium. I'm, I'm the ambassador of Chile. I will talk about Chile and I will say a few words that my colleague from Uruguay asked me to say about energy in her country. Uh, as you know, the potential of renewable energy in, in Chile is immense. The Atacama Desert is one of the driest places on earth. It's also one of the world's best locations for solar energy generation. The northern and the southern region of our country offer favorable conditions to offshore wind energy projects. And Chile is committed to achieve net zero to 2050 and to have 80% of a renewable source by 2030, similar target as Australia. In the recent years, we have uh, witnessed commendable progress in renewable energy adoption. Numerous solar and wind projects have been established, contribute, contributing to an increasing share of renewable energy in, in our energy mix, reaching 33% last year and surpassing the coal generation for the first time last year. Of course, those developments uh, not only reduce our carbon footprint, but also create jobs, stimulate economic growth, and enhance energy security. Wherever, we must also acknowledge that the challenges that lie ahead and set collaboration stream with countries like Australia to find solutions to those challenges. The integration of renewable energy sources into the grid require investment in, in energy storage and smart grid technology to ensure a stable and reliable supply. Therefore, there is plenty of business opportunity in generation, transmission, distribution, storage. We have an upcoming tender for two billion US dollars for distribution storage next week, next year. Efficiency among other technology to optimize the energy consumption. Let me say a few words about Uruguay. Uruguay has successfully gone through its first energy transition, thus achievement a power matrix in which participation of energy coming from renewable sources reached almost 98%, which positioned the country number two in the world for clean energy usage. Current energy policies are focused on the second energy transitions, which seeks to decarbonize the primary energy supply matrix in a directly related to innovate transport alternative that can displace the use of hydrocarbon and the development of a green hydrogen economy for both the local market and for export. Uruguay has several attributes to be an exporter of green hydrogen, like Chile and Australia, and derivatives such as high potential for renewable energy generation and resource complementarity, high availability of CO2, water biomass, access to the Atlantic Ocean with no major geographical features, access route to the entire country and infrastructure to for the local transportation of hydrogen and its derivatives, as well as political, institution, institutional and legal stability. Efficiency and sustainability in transportation are a priority for Uruguay. So, within the framework of the second energy transition, 
Uruguay is also promoting a policy to promote electromobility that adds fiscal and direct benefit, regulation, training, and the necessary infrastructure. Thank you very much. Great. Juliana. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Juliana. I'm a research fellow at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Uh, I'm working at the Development Minerals Program and also at the JKMRC or Mineral Research Center. Um, my, I'm from Colombia and my background is in different fields of engineering, including chemical engineering, but I also specialize in uh, metallurgical engineering and uh, environmental uh, assessment from a holistic uh, life cycle perspective. So um, I'm currently working on an initiative focused on uh, circular economy approaches for the mining sector, uh, focused on proactive mine waste management, uh, I mean to reduce it at the source, and uh, which also brings additional benefits, including uh, carbon emissions reduction and other po potential benefits. Uh, so uh, my research has also focused on quantifying the environmental impacts throughout the value chain and uh, find uh, alternative uh, scenarios for improving the, the performance of mining operations. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Isabel Franco. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here. And um, well, I'd just like to share a little bit of my career path, which hasn't been very conventional, although we are at the University of Queensland, which is my alma mater. Um, I haven't followed the academic career as such. Um, my career started back in Colombia. I'm originally com from Colombia. I think half of these panelists are Colombian, so a matter of coincidence, I guess. Um, working uh, for the government. I was working for the Ministry of Education, the British Council, for a while back in Colombia. Came here with a, with a back full of dreams, I guess, as any other uh, uh, Latinos who are here in the room. And um, I got a PhD, a PhD scholarship to, to, to do my PhD studies here at uh, the Sustainable Mineral Institute. Um, very grateful for that opportunity uh, because it really opened doors for me. 2014, finished my PhD, and then I always had that dream. I wanted to work for the UN, for the United Nations, and I did it. Um, I started a career at the UN, working across various countries, um, the, and that led me to do a postdoc at the United Nations University um, in Japan, in Tokyo. Um, the focus was on sustainability, but I was working across various issues. Um, I stay away a little bit from sustainability in mining, and then I started working more on corporate sustainability issues. Um, came back to Australia, worked for the private sector for a while, and I decided, well, it's time to start my own thing, my own business. I always have that entrepreneurship uh, motivation inside, and, and within, and, and, and here I am. Um, so I'm working now on the International Institute for uh, Better Futures. Uh, professor, professor Castells, I think he was through his research and he was a huge inspiration to pursue this journey. And uh, it's been a, a tough journey for all those entrepreneurs who are here, uh, but uh, it's very rewarding as well. So very thankful for being here and uh, thank you so much for the invite. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all. Um, pleasure to be here also. Um, great to see all the ambassadors here also representing the Latin American community. Um, well, my name is Daniel Nieto, as Tim mentioned before. Um, I'm also original from Colombia, so we have plenty of Colombians here today. Um, I originally um, study uh, petroleum engineering, so I worked in Colombia for uh, several years as a drilling and completions engineer. Um, when the price of the oil uh, price crash. Uh, I decided to came to Australia and initially just for six months uh, to do an English course. So I think that that's um, a common path for international students that come here and do six months and they, they love the country and stay for longer. So um, I did that. Um, and while I was doing that, I started traveling around the country and traveling around uh, Asia Pacific. And I realized that I didn't want to, um, well, it was. Not that it didn't, but um, there was not many opportunities to continue working in oil and gas during that time. So I was looking for opportunities to broaden my, my skills and my knowledge. 
And I decided to uh, pursue a master's uh, at UQ um, as a sustainable energy um, student. So I got a scholarship and I did the master's of sustainable energy student at UQ from 2018-2020. Um, I guess the changing from the dark side to the bright side, as so many people think. Um, and then from there, um, after graduating from UQ, um, I started working for the Center for Natural Gas. So I did um, a research um, understanding the, um, how, the, how the U.S. became an um, energy exporter from being an ener energy importer, which I uh, was um, touching base on what you mentioned before on the importance of, of having that um, government support. And then after that, I started working for RK Energy, uh, which is uh, a small consulting firm um, based here in Brisbane. Um, so we are um, working in different um, projects uh, across the country. So we do work on the renewable energy zones for, for New South Wales. We are also uh, project engineers um, developing the, um, the two large battery um, projects here in Queensland, one in Brendan, other one in Lockyer. And we do several studies on decarbonization strategies, um, um, offsets, uh, and energy transition more broadly. Uh, aside from that, I'm also um, um, a leader of the Latin American community. So I'm the president of the Australian Latin American Joint Professional Society, um, where we try to encourage um, Latin American people to uh, start uh, and bring their skills to, um, to the industry here in Australia. So they, when you are an international student, um, many of the jobs that you do is just focusing on on um, non-professional jobs, so hospitality, cleaning, uh, and so on. So what we're trying to do with the Alive is just to bring those skills that are required here in Australia to get into the jobs that, that they're uh, dreaming to work on. So yeah, that's a bit of me. Great, thanks. All right, so as the only monolingual member of the panel, I'm feeling a little bit under, <laughs> underpowered at the moment, but I'll, I'll do my best to, 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 to get us through. So what we have now is, again, similarly to the last panel, we have a set of questions um, that are preset that will, the, that will allow us to take, a, I think, a few different perspectives on this both the challenges and the opportunities that we face in going from where we are to getting to net zero in 27 very short years at this point. Um, so the first question will go back uh, to Jaime, which is, um, you know, we, we have a global push towards renewables. Um, we have uh, a, a high level of ambition to reach a very challenging goal in electricity generation. Um, so what are some of the approaches and policies that are taking place in Chile right now that are supporting that movement? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very impressed to have three Colombian in this panel, and it's a gender equality panel, so I'm happy. And congratulations for you. I, I don't know where are the Chileans today, because somebody told me that there are plenty of Chileans here. And <laughs> ah, there are some. Well, um, well, as I said, Chile has a strong commitment, has a state, uh, not subject to political changes, to climate ambition and reach net zero by 2050. Uh, this is a very long-term energy policy. The debt of our national determined contribution last year, we did, and we passed a law of climate change framework law and the creation of the green hydrogen strategy in order to tackle energy consumption in all sectors, even the, in those hard to abate. And, and the mining sector in Chile are already using renewable as primary source of energy and working to, to, to introduce electrification solution and potential hydrogen use into the operation. Great, thank you. Um, Juliana, the, so one really important part of this is going to be innovation, which is your area of expertise. And so, um, you know, to, to do this, we need new technologies. Uh, we need to get them to scale. We need to get them adopted. Um, so what are some of the challenges and ways that we can promote techno technological innovation all the way through the value chain? Yeah, so um, I think there is... Uh, a big challenge in terms of um, upscaling new technologies that um, 
are currently being studied for decarbonization and also for the mitigation of other impacts. Um, so uh, what usually happens is that um, m most of the research is done in well in universities, institutions, uh, and the to upscale those technologies, we uh, we need funding, right? We need to invest more. Uh, and also, it's a process that takes time. It's, it doesn't happen from one, one day to another. So it's also important to acknowledge that uh, innovation is, is a long process. Um, so uh, we, we, I think we, we have really good projects uh, at the University of Queensland and here in, in Australia and in Chile as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, innov innovation requires time and resources and also collaboration. Uh, sharing knowledge uh, between different partners and also support from industry and government of course uh, so uh, and also uh, another uh, well uh, there's sev several innovations that are currently happening uh, across the value chain uh, but uh, there is a, a very important one is related to the data that I was mentioned in the previous panel and digitalization and also uh, the traceability of the impacts of the materials across the value chain and and these kind of initiatives are very helpful uh, not only to account uh, in a transparent manner uh, about uh, how uh, a product uh, is, how environmentally friendly is but also to inform the consumers Right. So, uh, and and this is also uh, a really good uh, initiative that has been uh, supported by uh, holistic uh, life cycle approaches. Uh, one of example of this kind of initiatives is the battery passport. And yeah, so I think we in the mining sector we uh, still have a lot to do in this area. And also, uh, yeah, there are also many technologies available that need to be uh, tested uh, at pilot scale and also in uh, industrial environments uh, and demonstrate uh, the, not only the technical but also economic feasibility uh, uh, and at the same time uh, ensuring that uh, we are not generating additional impacts. Yeah. So I think two, two really important emerging themes from today that you've touched on. One is that transparency and portability of data um, which come up multiple times. I think the other one, which we could do a whole other panel on, is financing for some of these new ideas, right? Because that's at the core of the question that Rick asked at the, the end of the keynote, um, and it's, it's something that's really important to getting innovations out into the world as well. So that's good, thanks. Um, Isabel, um, one of the things that is easy to forget if you spend most of your time in a city like Brisbane is that things are actually happening out in regions. Um, and so when we think about um, the impact that net zero transition will have in the regions, um, especially ones that are very resource dependent right now, um, this creates both challenges and opportunities. So what are some of the opportunities that are arising from decarbonization that will create new industries and new jobs in regional areas? Thank you, team, for the question. Um, earlier stages in my career, I was mainly focused on mining and sustainability in mining. And I had the opportunity to work across regions. Um, I was the type of researcher that used to go with the communities go in, and uh, really live with the communities for, for a few for weeks, right? And you have that sense of community that's very important because that, that tells us a lot when it comes to translate outcomes, research outcomes to corporations. But I've, over the Time, especially over the past few years, I've moved to a new sector, a new industry, which is renewables, solar, hydrogen, um, which is a very um, exciting opportunity, I guess. This is a new a new market with new players, um, uh, with totally um, um, new or even sometimes in existence governance frameworks. I recently I had the opportunity to advise a, ma a major, um, a large um, um, solar project and that is happening in Asia Pacific. Um, it was a, this was a thirty billion dollar project, and um, and I delivered the social impact management plan for the project. It was um, 
very interesting in terms of precisely the opportunities that the project potentially will have on, on communities. And I could identify four of those uh, four key opportunities. There could be more, of course, but I'm just focusing on that particular experience. So the first one has to do with local procurement. And I think that not only happens in the renewable sector, but also in the mining industry as well. Um, but one of the things and the challenges that I've found is that local communities in conversations with communities and uh, community consultations, what I found is that local businesses don't have the skills to, for example, win tenders, right? Or um, um, they don't have enough contractors to supply or suppliers, right, to uh, provide uh, large businesses, like, for example, this one I advise in Asia Pacific. And um, so there is a huge opportunity from the private sector in investing in community capacity building. That's one of the issues that actually I explored at early stages of my academic career. Um, and um, um, that's in terms of, of local procurement. Second opportunity I, I see is has to do with workforce development. This is not new, but um, in the mining industry, uh, my PhD, by the way, was on human capital development, and I look at that issue uh, both in Colombia and northern Queensland, and I found the issues were quite similar in terms of, the, of skill shortage in the industry. That applies to the renewable um, uh, sector, to clean energy industries as well. There are not many people um, with the skills, right, except for a few, like you are one of the, like is uh, Daniel who got a scholarship on sustainable energy. Not many people with the skills, with the technical skills to actually um, undertake massive projects as, as, as um, for example, this project, which is uh, uh, comprises three different countries, right? And supplies 25 um, industrial energy to from country to country. So it's massive, we don't have the, the, the expertise. Now, when it comes to workforce development, we need to, if we're thinking, I mean, that, that's an opportunity for the private sector. And they should be thinking not only of training the technical, uh, um, on that technical expertise, particularly if it is mining or renewables, but also in other industries that are relevant for the local economy as well. Uh, third opportunity has to do with energy solutions and security, and I see that more often in the renewable space. Um, there is a huge expectations from communities, uh, particularly when they see, and that was in a, in a solar panel that I advised, um, a solar panel project. Um, Obviously, when communities they see like massive solar farms, they think that they are going to get free energy, and there's a huge governance risk in the long term, and social risk in the long term because uh, they're thinking um, eventually if they don't get the energy that they are thinking of, it might compromise the social license to operate for the business, and that happens in the private sector, in the mining industry as well. I documented cases in the which the mine, uh, mining company came operated, but, but that was back in Colombia. It was a Canadian company operating in Colombia, and uh, they um, they wanted to expand to a different location, but they didn't deliver what they supposed they were going to deliver at the local level and location one, and they were denied the social license to operate. So they rebranded over the time, uh, but that still didn't work because communities are very well connected nowadays. So um, businesses should be very careful with uh, on that. Aspect and finally, uh, the fourth opportunity has to do with infrastructure and social investment, um, and that's something that has been documented in terms of cumulative impacts, right? In terms of housing and infrastructure, and we see that the housing prices go up, especially in mining towns. So how um, private sectors can the private sector can arrange or organize collaborations with the local government to provide at least local um, locals with uh, facilities. So in this case that I've mentioned before, um, one of the options was to come up with a facility for Aboriginal communities so that we could actually spend time on site and didn't have to pay for high price uh, uh, accommodation. So those are the four key. There could be more, but just to summarize. <laughs> Started. Yep. Uh, so Daniel, um, so, so one of the things that Isabel just touched on is that really real importance of engaging with communities. Uh, when we're working on this in, in, in this space. So social engagement, working with communities, um, and gaining a, a shared understanding of what's going on with the, in the energy industry is a really important part of this, and that's your area. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of the f best practices and things that you've learned about 
how to incorporate communities into uh, project development. Yeah, thank you. I think that I'll probably, so I'll probably touch base on a couple of them and uh, and uh, and agree with channel before on the importance of share share language. Uh, I think that one of the things that we have realized um, coming with um, different uh, from different industries and learnings that we got through the oil and gas industry is that having that early engagement with communities is really important. Um, understanding what they want and what they actually need. Um, so just to put that on, on the perspective, for example, in Colombia, what we saw before is that. Um, Industry didn't engage as as required with communities, and they saw building libraries or or multi-purpose buildings that were not actually what the community need, and the these buildings then become or this infrastructure then became um, we we call them a um, white elephant or the elephant in the room because they was buildings that were not required by the communities and there were not a need for those. Uh, so having those early conversations with the community is really important. Also having those transparency within the community, uh, setting out the expectations, as Isabel mentioned before, is really important. So um, talking about the risk um, and, and the advantages that the, the different projects are going to come up with uh, is really important. So to set them the expectations that this project is going to probably have an impact on, on their land, but what are the benefits that they're taking out of that is also really important. Um, one of the things that I worked with um, while I was doing the Master of Sustainable Energy was um, research that we work with um, an oil and gas producer here in Queenstown and was understanding a uh, shared value. So that's looking at opportunities where um, an infrastructure energy project not only benefit the community, but also create a positive impact within the within the company. So um, this shared value creation is also uh, an important thing that companies should look into. And um, just to also mention on the early uh, stakeholder engagement, um, some of the practices that we're doing um, um, in, in, in our key is having um, early contractor involvement. So not only working with communities, but also working with your contractors um, to understand what are the key elements of the project to, to take the project from a concept to a, a FID process. Uh, so that's also an important part. Um, and maybe just to finalize um, on, on how to deal with community or is um, communicating in a proper way what are the what are the pathways of communication? So how, what is the conflict um, pathway? Uh, who do I need to talk with uh, to avoid the strike? So uh, one of the learnings from Colombia is that we, where communities um, tend to don't have those channels of communication. What they do is just they go and stop operations or just don't turn out to work. So when you create those uh, channels of communication, then that helps the community to understand who do they need to talk to and creating also those uh, leaders within the community that can translate all the different issues or, or questions that the community has to, to, the, to the developer is also really important. Oh, that's really good. So if, if, you, if you just think about how those questions just went, we started with policy, right? That encourages technology and R&D. Um, that creates technologies that get deployed in a location, um, which creates opportunities and threats. Um, and the interaction between the people and companies deploying those technologies and the people and communities on site um, ends up being really important to the success of the project. So we've actually gone all the way from policy to interactions between people as critical. And I think that's, it's that ecosystem approach, that complex approach that is really critical to actually working out how we do this. And so, um, Jaime, we, you know, all of that is based on collaboration, right, across industry, government, um, and, and people. Um, so how should we be engaging with all those groups we've just talked about, and even broader groups like advisory, um, R&D people, translation partners, so that we actually are able to grow this mission and achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves. Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I, I agree with you. I think collaboration is key for, for, for any country. I think Chile is a good example of collaboration between the private sector, the government, the research, the academia. And in the case of a broader collaboration with foreign countries, I think Australia also is a good example. Chile, we have several Australian institutions working in Chile. The Sustainable Mining Institute from the University of Queensland is very important. CISAIRO also 
has an office in Chile, and the Australian Mineral Industrial Research Association also. So, but we think that there is a lot of opportunities to engage in new projects of collaboration with Australia in general and with, uh, with uh, Queensland in particular. And I think the development of professional and technical skill to the future of uh, the low emission industry will be a key for our new industry that is creating. So I think there is a, an opportunity to work with Queensland in this area. Skill development comes up so frequently. I mean, Janelle talked about it in the first the first panel as a really important thing from an industry side. But even when you get to the community side, uh, people are saying, "Well, there's a there's a skill shortage." And Isabel touched on that in her her first uh, answer as well. All right. Um, so, Juliana, the the you know we're talking about emissions reductions, um, many of which come from the outputs of mines. Um, and so when we, when we talk about the mining industry in Australia and Latin America, um, what, what, what role does the industry play in this energy transition, um, particularly given the contribution that um, the outputs are making to greenhouse gas levels? Yeah, so it's, mining has uh, key roles in this transition, right? Uh, one, as previously mentioned and also presented here uh, in terms of supplying uh, essential minerals, uh, metals, and materials for this uh, transition to happen, right? Uh, and it's, it's not only uh, the, the critical me uh, metals, but also other uh, essential materials for the local development, for the development of the infrastructure required for those uh, alternative energies. And I'm um, talking about uh, the development minerals. Uh, so this is also something that use, usually is overlooked uh, and sometimes it's not a, there is no awareness about the massive volumes of materials we will requ require for this transition and that we are, are already extracting from nature uh, in terms of sand, uh, aggregates and crushed rock. Uh, we uh, extract billion tons per year, and and this is also creating a lot of impacts, not only uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions for the case of manufactured sand, for instance, but also uh, there are uh, other different impacts in, on local communities and also on ecosystems around the world uh, from unsustainable sand extraction practices. So this is something that can be also linked uh, it's also essential, and why I'm talking about this is because uh, in the search for these uh, critical metals, we are also, we, as Helen mentioned before, we need to look at the resources as, uh, as a whole, right? And try to take as much as possible. Uh, and, and there is a big opportunity to also uh, co-produce sand, for instance, in, in those uh, new operations, instead of sending these silicate-rich materials to the waste, to the tailings, right? And this is the approach we are taking, uh, one of the approaches we are taking at SMI. Uh, so uh, I'm working on that. And, and, and we have seen that, uh, well, some mining companies started doing that and also have found that uh, there are also benefits in terms of carbon emissions reduction. Uh, compared to conventional sands. Uh, the challenge here is uh, about the transportation, but uh, it, there are many uh, places where this uh, approach can be applied, uh, as demonstrated by a previous study led by the University of Queensland in partnership uh, with the University of Geneva. So this is one of, of the potential solutions we see here. Uh, also, there are also there are opportunities in terms of uh, resource efficiency. Uh, well, the industry uh, is also working hard on in decarbonization, especially transitioning to renewable energy, uh, and also uh, electrification of their uh, equipment and vehicles. So this also contributes to lower the emissions. But uh, yeah, we, we need to keep uh, a broader perspective, not only focus on greenhouse gases, but also on other 
potential uh, impacts in, in, the, in the environment, but also in the communities. And I also agree with the importance of integrating the value chains and, and also uh, use this for uh, the local development and also generating more uh, employment and and also bring more resources to the, for the development of the regions. And I, I think uh, Australia and Chile can have a, a key role on, on leading this pathway. So yeah, I think that's a good way to progress. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, so, so we've touched a little bit on the intersection between um, policy and funding. Um, and, and, and to make all of this work, we really need to be thinking and acting on um, developing and establishing higher environmental and social standards. Um, so what are some of the strategies that we can follow that will help us do that and that will enable us to reward players in, in the, the system that have strong environmental and social performance? Well, thank you for the question again, Tim. Um, I'll give you an example of a strategy that we came up with uh, the United Nations. That was a piece of work that I did in collaboration with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, we uh, work with companies out there um, aligned with the United Nations Global Compact. The United Glo uh, Nations Global Compact is a set of 10 principles on socially responsible business. And what we found, it was very interesting, but we found that only 11% of those companies in Asia Pacific particularly um, I'll uh, fully comply um, across all the 10 principles, only 11%. So um, we decided at the time to do more extensive policy relevant research and uh, came up with a model to sustainable business hmm, to help those corporations integrate best practices, both at the social and environmental level into their operations. That's, um, that's, um, um, that manuscript is available at IBF.international. And uh, it also helped um, organizations to come up with a roadmap. Mm -hmm. Where are we going in terms of uh, meeting the United Nations agenda, for example? Um, after that, we came up with some capacity building and executive education for leaders, uh, those organizations, because if you don't target the leadership, nothing will happen underneath. And you teach uh, the MBA, and you know if you don't convince executives that that's important, they won't, won't invest. Um, so the model... Um, the benefits that we that we saw over the time, um, because we we came up with a, the study, we continued the study over the time, and uh, there are nine benefits actually that we found for those companies that integrated that sustainable business model. So the first one is brand differentiation. Okay, so definitely there is a there is a difference in terms of reputational capital of those companies who um, that uh, perform environmentally and socially responsible in a responsible manner. Customer engagement, increasing in terms of customer en engagement. We found that 78% of consumers, they were more likely to buy uh, and purchase goods that um, came from companies that were fully compliant um, in terms of the um, UN Global um, Compact um, principles. Employee engagement, yeah. Most of the employees, they say, well, why do I want to work at a company that doesn't respect, for example, human rights, right? Um, risk reduction in terms of social, environmental, and health and safety issues. Um, cost reduction as well. It, um, it helped the company to just to reduce cost at some point. Innovation, there was a major increase in innovation. Innovation, which is your, your, your field team. Uh, major, major investments we saw in terms of uh, research and development, for example. Positive risk culture um, but that comes again you know like with that understanding from the leadership and better governance uh, structures at the at the leadership level um, value creation was another benefit in uh, competitive advantage compared to other companies that were not fully compliant with the uh, with the principles and did not follow the um, that did, didn't integrate the sustainable business model that we came up with so actually the benefits are quite a few 
Um, and those are tangible uh, benefits that we managed to um, measure over the time in those companies. But that was Asia Pacific, but I mean, that can be applied to other regions across, yeah. Yeah. I always find it really interesting thinking about the mining sector because often some of the pushback that you get against these kinds of initiatives is that it's just too hard to change. Uh, and yet, if you look at just the transformation in safety and safety standards over the last 25 years, um, it really clearly can be done. Um, and, 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 and in fact, when you do it, you get the same kind of set of benefits. So uh, I do think there's a good case for change and, and, and actually examples of it um, in this exact industry. Um, so Daniel, the, the, you know, so we've been talking about innovation, engagement with sta stakeholders, developing low carbon technologies. Uh, all of these are critical for making this transition that we're talking about. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your experience in delivering projects that take all of these things into account? Yeah, definitely. I think that, that uh, that's a really good point there on innovation. Um, just to um, just share a little bit of a story, we are developing this battery project and and the innovation that is happening um, is just impressive there already. So we we get an update on on improving on technology every three months, and it's really hard to keep on on with all the improvement on the technology. So I think that innovation is playing a key part on 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 the development of projects. Uh, from experience, uh, from from the industry and from the from the research that I that I have been conducting in oil and gas, especially, um, I always look at um, an oil and gas as a good example to um, to understand how innovation drive um, uh, technology development. So, uh, if you look at um, at the improvement that we have done from uh, just drilling wells through 100 meters to drilling wells to a thousand uh, meters deep uh, with deviated horizontal. Uh, using um, different technologies, uh, not as popular as fracking, but uh, using different technologies. Um, it, even though they're not popular technologies, the, the innovation that drives those technologies is really impressive. Um, so those those innovations is the one that are driving the change, and I think that we we need to see more of those um, technologies coming through. And for that to happen, I feel that we need to get more government support. So I think that, um, Julia I mentioned before, uh, the importance of uh, that collaboration between not just universities doing research and R&D, but having those um, technologies um, actually being implemented in, in the industry is really important. And uh, I was last week on, on a conference on the Energy Council where Istanbul will present at the center of excellence. What they are trying to do is to uh, test different electrolyzers to actually put it into tests uh, to see what are the outcomes. Um, also testing battery technologies. So I think that those uh, is leading to just collaboration between R&D, universities, communities, uh, and industry is really important. And sometimes we are lacking that um, and we are lacking that collaboration, and it's maybe just because we are just lacking the the right in safety to to do it. So, uh, if there is no funding to do those projects, then it's really hard to get these projects going on. So, um, it's always talk about what we can do as an um, as an uh, as an industry, but it's also what the government can help to develop these projects more broadly. That's great. Thank you. So. Um, so we have about four minutes uh, left, and um, we've actually generated a lot of pretty interesting questions on the Padlet, so you've clearly done a good job of being interesting. Um, so we'll, we'll maybe take uh, two of them cover the same uh, related topic, and so I'll ask that question first about land use, and then we might have one time for one question uh, in the room as well, so we'll see how that goes. But um, two of the, two, the, the first two questions on the Padlet both talk about land. Um, and so one of the things that we run into when we start thinking about um, renewable, you know, you mentioned it, Isabel, with, with solar panels on land and what do people expect when those show up. Um, so we have, we have the issue of land use for renewable energy. We see it with wind farms as well. Um, in Australia, we get... Um, when people are searching for critical minerals, we get conflict between agricultural use of the land and mining use of the land. So that becomes an issue. And then one of the other people on the Padlet raised the point, which I know applies both in Latin America and in here in Australia, and that is that many renewable resources 
um, sit on lands that have um, important um, either ownership or use relationships with indigenous peoples in both locations. So um, what thoughts do we have about prioritizing land use um, in, in this area? And we can talk about it as policy or uh, practice depending on, on what, what people are thinking. Well, I, what I could see in terms of uh, in, in the renewable sector is that, well, mining, I think the governance framework is more well, <laughs> more or less better established than the governance frameworks in, in renewables. And, and I could see that because when I was uh, working on the social impact management plan for this, um, our renewable projects, um, we had to somehow translate the governance uh, policies and, and and frameworks from mining to the uh, to apply the, the governance frameworks from mining to the renewable sector, and that's a huge. Um, I think there is a, there is a huge gap because I mean the, there is a, it's a totally different industry, and uh, land use is obviously is different from from mining, which is more disturbing, uh, disruptive in, in terms of environmental and social outcomes. Um, so I think more uh, like better or like come up with with governance frameworks for that particular industry. That's very very important. Um, also, something that I realized is that this project was in Northern Territory, and I was working with legislation with New South Wales because actually NEPA didn't have like outstanding information in terms of how to um, come up with a social impact management plan. So there was a huge gap in terms of legislation across states. So um, I think that's in terms in in the in the Australian case. The Latin American case is different because governance frameworks are very flexible sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, quite a few um, governance issues that need to be sorted at the local level as well. So uh, the governance uh, scenario in Latin America is a bit, uh, sometimes can be a bit uh, um, interesting and complex to navigate. So it needs, um, I, I had the opportunity to, to advise um, another project that was Africa, but I mean, I think applies to the Latin American context. And one of the, the uh, one of the recommendations was to bring uh, a third party to the table, the extractive industries a transparency initiative to oversee, for example, the allocation of royalties that come to the community and uh, out of mining projects. That was an interesting recommendation. Did and uh, the beginning was not well received, but over the time, I mean, it was the best thing to do because it, that was in Angola um, that um, the mining, like oil, hadn't delivered the out. Uh, the uh, uh, positive outputs to the community, and they didn't want the same happen with mining. So um, I think that applies to the Latin American countries as well, like bringing those third parties just to oversee that actually that royalty allocation in terms of and land use as well, it's happening in a correct manner. Yeah. Good. Rick, are we should we should we wrap here or should we check for questions in the room? I I check for a question. Okay. Does anybody here have a, have a, a burning question at this point? Even just a simmering one. Oh, that, that might be it then. All right. Thank you, everyone, for a very interesting conversation. I think just to summarize, I think the, the, the really consistent theme across all of this is collaboration and connection, right, across sectors, across countries, across industries. Um, and so I'll, Events like this are very good to support that. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim and, and panel. That was a, a really thought-provoking panel. And there were a lot more questions on the on the Padlet. And, I, and once again, I apologize for running, running you a bit over at the start. Um, so now I'm very honored to invite Her Excellency Mrs. Daniela P. Ambassador of Uruguay to the lectern to give her closing remarks. Many thanks, Professor Valenta. Let me start by acknowledging the presence of Joe Kelly, MP, the chair of our group of friends, 
uh, UK authorities, UK professors and students, members of the Australian government, all guests and my fellow head of mission. I'm honored to represent the Latin American embassies in these closing remarks. Many thanks to the University of Queensland for organizing once again a very interesting colloquium which allow us to exchange experiences and identify ways of cooperation with the aim of continue strengthening the ties between Australia and Latin America. I have the hard task of wrapping up a full morning of outstanding presentations done by very experienced people, and I only have a few minutes to do that, so I won't repeat all of them. We are all facing environmental challenges. Uh, we have committed to reduce greenhouse emissions and to build resilience to adapt to the impacts of climate change. This is something that requires joint effort, cooperation among countries, and the participation of governments, the private sector, the academia, and civil society. We have heard today about the need for a collaborative approach. A huge rise in demand for critical minerals raised questions about whether this growth can be supplied in a reliable manner and whether the environmental and social consequences associated with mineral, mineral production can be managed properly. While minerals play a vital role in supporting clean energy transition, energy is also crucial in the production of minerals. Policymakers have a fundamental role in determining whether critical minerals are a vital enable for clean energy transition or a bottleneck in the process. At the same time, mining and processing companies face growing pressure to address these and other issues related to their social and environmental performance. A growing number of consumers and investors are requesting companies to disclose targets and action plans on these issues. While each country has different motivations and approaches to the issue of critical minerals, their experience provides useful lessons for designing frameworks to ensure reliable mineral supplies. An approach to, ensure, uh, to ensuring reliable, reliable mineral supplies need to be multifaceted, covering a wide range of aspects from supply to demand to, demand to recycling. It is quite clear that there is a need for adequate investment in, the, in diversifying sources of new supply, being energy transition critical to bring forward timely investment. Energy transition implies a structural and long-term change of an energy system. Although there have been several energy transitions through the history of humanity, the current one presents a differential feature with respect to previous one. It is strongly driven by environmental motivations. The main objective of this transition is to mit mitigate the effects of climate change by reducing net greenhouse gas emissions. In the future, energy demand is expected to increase due to a considerable increase in the world's population and the continuous growth of countries' economy. Therefore, achieving global carbon neutrality by 2050 constitutes one of the most important global challenges to be faced and will require, among other actions, an energy transition that includes supply from renewable energy sources and the extension of the energy efficiency culture to all areas of activities. Today we have examples, not only driven by governments, but also by the academia and the private sector. We heard about Chile, an important producer of critical minerals with natural capacity to produce low-cost renewable energy. We also heard about my own country, and I thank you, Ambassador, for that, which has undergo, undergone a real revolution in the last decade and is now number two in the world for clean energy usage. We are ranking only after Denmark. But these are only two examples. Latin America is quite diverse and quite huge, and it's almost impossible to think of, a, of an only model, even to think about a, a group of legislation. We are quite, quite different. And I'm sure each Latin American country has its own experience to share. Our countries have plenty of critical minerals, as well as enormous potential for renewable energy and for the production of green hydrogen that can help to accelerate the transition to carbon neutrality. As leaders in the development of these new industries, we will be all placed to solve global challenges together, sharing experience and expertise. As one of the panelists mentioned today, let's join, let's join markets rather than being competitive. The world is facing today multiple challenges linked to, linked to climate change, 
let's take this opportunity to work together, Australia and Latin America, in order to overcome those challenges and to comply with international commitments. This is, there is an enormous opportunity for collaboration for the benefit, benefit of our countries, our people and the world. I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, I'd now like to welcome uh, Sao Paulo State University's Associate Provost for International Affairs, Professor Jose Celso Freire Jr. to the lectern to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, as a... Uh, as we conclude this engaging colloquium on advancing Latin American and Australian relations, I want to emphasize the profound significance of the partnerships between the, these two regions. We have had the, the privilege of exploring how this collaboration can reshape some aspects of our global future. Furthermore, as a Brazilian, uh, I want to emphasize the critical role Br Brazil could play in this effort. Brazil is a diverse and dynamic nation with rich resources, a robust economy, and an unwa unwavering uh, commitment to sustainability reaffirmed under the leadership of President Lula. Brazil again reasserts its commitment to promoting progress and unity in, in a world that urgently needs both. Throughout this colloquium, we have had a delve into pivotal topics that shape our shared future. The panel uh, on supporting the reliable supply of critical minerals and the journey to net zero opportunities and challenges for Australia and Latin America amid the global push towards renewable and zero carbon commodities have highlighted the intricate interplay between responsible research management, international collaboration, and the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral world. Supporting the reliable supply of critical minerals is paramount in our rapidly evolving world. These minerals are the lifeblood of modern technologies, from smartphones to electrical vehicles. Ensuring a steady and sustainable supply is not only an economic imperative, but also a strategic one. It calls for professional development, responsible uh, mining practices, international cooperation, and investments in recycling and innovation. By safeguarding, safeguarding the vital research, we paved the way for a resilient and sustainable future where technology drives, uh, drives a progress without compromising our environment and global stability. Together, we can secure the foundation of our technological age and build a brighter, more sustainable tomorrow. The journey to net zero emissions presented opportunities and challenges for Australia and Latin America, among us the global shift towards renewable and zero carbon commodities. Abundant renewable resources offer the chance to reduce emission, create jobs and foster innovation. However, policy uncertainties, economic uh, transitions, and the need to balance grow with environmental preservation pose significant challenges, as well as the interaction with the local communities, as mentioned here. Collaboration between uh, these regions uh, are, are vital to shared learning and sustainable progress. Australia and Latin America can lead in clean energy, sustainable practices, and zero carbon commodities, contributing to a greener, more prosperous world for all. This journey is challenging, but also an unparalleled opportunity to shape a sustainable future. 
In closing, let us uh, rem uh, remember that progress is built upon collaboration, as mentioned by uh, 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 Uruguay uh, Ambassador. Together, we can build a more interconnected future for Latin America and Australia, setting an example for the world to follow. And let me close with a message of hope in the challenges we face uh, if the challenges we face are substantial, through unity, innovation, and shared commitment, Latin America and Australia can lead the way in sustainable research supply and the journey to net zero emissions. Together, we can forge a path to a brighter, greener, and more prosperous world for future generations. Thank you all for this terrific morning, and I appreciate your dedication to these uh, crucial discussions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor. This brings us to the end of today's program, but before we close, um, I did want to um, thank Brett and his team. All of these things don't appear by, by magic. There's a lot of organization that goes on in the background. And I know I'm going to miss some people, so I'm only going to say the names I know. And my apologies to those of you who've also been working hard. So Kayla, Daphne, Nicole, and, and others, thank you very much for all the hard work that you've put in to, to, um, to make this morning's meeting a, a success. Um, and could you please join me in, in thanking um, Brett's team, but also thanking all of the moderators, speakers, and panelists this morning. Um, just a reminder, uh, today's event will be uploaded, um, the recording of it will be uploaded in the coming days, and all of the registered attendees will receive an email with a link so that you can review anything that's in there. Um, there's also, uh, in the program, there's a link to a QR code with the event survey, um, and it's also, hopefully, no, it isn't, but uh, here it's, yes, it is now, yeah, it's, it's being displayed behind me. It'd be really great if you could uh, provide us feedback so that we can make uh, next year's version of this even better. Um, for those of you online as well, I'm looking at the cameras now, uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a lovely morning or evening. Um, for those who are attending the ambassadorial luncheon, please meet Ms. Kayla Warner at the foyer doors and she'll accompany to the venue accompany you to the venue. So once again, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day.